Thank you. Доброго ранку, Маджі Уа, Your Excellencies Ambassadors, Honorable Speakers, Dear Guests in Audience, and our online participants, thank you very much for being with us today. My name is Hanna Basilo. I represent Ukrainian Action in Ireland, and I would like to warmly welcome you to the opening of a symposium, How Russian Propaganda and Disinformation Impact Societies Worldwide. We are very glad that storm that hit Ireland badly did not prevent this event from happening and bringing our wonderful speakers all the way from Washington DC, from Vilnius, from Kyiv, and we will have speakers joining us online from Brussels and Helsinki. This event is streamed online, it's recorded, and it will be published on our YouTube channel. But this is also the first time we are organizing this event in a hybrid form in this place. And I was told that there, is, there might be a little bit of a delay when we hear speakers online or in the room for those who join us online. So please be patient. And I hope that we can go through this event very smoothly. This symposium is organized upon the initiative of Ambassador of Ukraine to Ireland and Ukrainian community in Ireland in partnership and with support from the European Commission representation in Ireland and the United States embassies in Ireland. And with a great joy and privilege, I would like to give the floor to open the symposium to Ambassador of Ukraine to Ireland, Larissa Herasko. Good morning, uh, Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you all today uh, to this symposium on uh, how Russian propaganda and disinformation impact societies worldwide. This would not be uh, possible without uh, help uh, of our partners and friends from European Commission representation, from the uh, mission or embassy of US to Ireland and Ukrainian action. I hope uh, you are uh, as thrilled as I am to hear the opening remarks by the uh, head of the European uh, Commission representation, Barbara Noland, by the uh, ambassador of US to Ireland, Clara Cronin, and co-founder of Ukraine, Ukrainian organization, Ukrainian action, Hanna Basilo. And uh, to discuss the topic of Russia's disinformation with our distinguished speakers from Ukraine, the US, Ireland, the EU, and the Republic of Lithuania. Ladies and gentlemen, every day we dive into the ocean of information that includes social media, blogs, podcasts, television, newspaper, uh, and uh, discussion with friends, families, uh, families, and colleagues. With the uh, evolution of technology and the uh, prevalence of uh, smartphones, people tend to consume uh, a vast quantity of information throughout their waking hours. With so much information and our fingerprints, it is more important than, uh, than ever to be able to uh, discern fact from fiction, truth from lies. Unfortunately, there are those who seek to exploit the information overload to their own uh, nefarious purposes. Russia is one of the world's most prolific producers of disinformation. The widespread lack of belief in Russia and its representative statements stems from a history uh, of manipulative information tactics. Uh, Russia's consistent manipulation of information aims to obfuscate uh, the truth, making it challenging uh, for the public to discern factual realities. 
the systematic uh, dissemination of uh, misleading narratives erodes uh, trust and credibilities, uh, creating a climate where truth becomes increasingly elusive and difficult to uh, ascertain. Ukraine has been on the front lines of Russian, Russia's disinformation war for many years. We have seen firsthand the devastating impact um, uh, uh, that Russian disinformation can have on individuals, communities, and entire countries. The disinformation surrounding Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 uh, marked uh, an escalation in Russia's uh, long-standing information operations against Ukraine and open democracies. Disinformation narratives progressed from uh, propaganda and uh, historical revisionism, for example, uh, uh, insisting that uh, Crimea had always been Russian after Moscow's annexation in 2014, to false claim about neo-Nazi infiltration in Ukraine's government and conspiracy different conspiracy theories about Ukraine, U.S. Uh, bioweapons labs, uh, and many others. Uh, these efforts uh, represent just uh, a handful uh, of, of the way in which the Russian government and aligned actors use disinformation as a weapon to distract, confuse, and subvert opponents. Russia also employs the practices of using the latest technologies such as deepfake and AI. Uh, the research conducted by the University College Cork uh, looked at the Russian disinformation campaign of March 2022. Then Russia state media and social media accounts were used to distribute deepfakes that portray President Volodymyr Zelensky making statements about Ukraine's surrender. According to the UCC, it was the first time in history that Russian deepfake propaganda and misinformation have attempted to influence a war. Uh, the threats posed by Russian disinformation are not just hypothetical, they are real one. They have happened before and are happening right now not only in Ukraine, but in all countries where Russia wants to sow distrust in democratic institutions, such as media, the government, and uh, the electoral process. Ladies and gentlemen, Russia should be accountable for its disinformation and propaganda due to the far-reaching and detrimental consequences of this um, uh, deliberate action. The systematic disinformation of false narrative and manipulative information by Russian entities undermines the foundation of truth, uh, distorts uh, public perception, and erodes trust in democratic process. This deliberate manipulation of information is not just Ukrainian issue, but a global concern. Russian propaganda is produced uh, in uh, incredible large volumes and is broadcast or otherwise uh, distributed via many channels. This propaganda includes text, video, audio, and still imagery propaganda, uh, propagated via the internet, social media, satellite television, and traditional radio and television broadcasting. The producer and disseminators include a, uh, sub, um, a substantial force of paid internet trolls who also often attack or undermine views and information that run counter to Russian themes. Countering Russian propaganda demands a coordinated and strategic response from the international com community, from all of us. The, um, pervasive nature of disinformation uh, perpetuated by Russian sources necessitates a multi-faced approach to repeal its impact. Collaborative efforts 
on various, various fronts are key to effectively combating this challenge. It is a difficult task, but it is one that we must undertake. Uh, the stakes are too high to ignore. Thank you so much for your attention, and I wish uh, everyone a productive and fruitful discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I just want to highlight that Ambassador Grasco, since she be, was appointed ambassador here in Ireland, it was a very uh, challenging times. So since uh, when the invasion broke out in 2022, and her uh, strong position, her devotion to the Ukrainian community really made it, really raised the profile and helped so many Ukrainians in Ireland to find protection and to secure their rights. So thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, symbolically, our symposium is taking place in the beautiful Europe House, in the heart of Dublin. And taking this opportunity, I would also like to express huge gratitude on behalf of the Ukrainian community in Ireland and Ukrainian communities all over the EU countries to the European Union, its agencies, members of parliament and everybody who ensured that Ukrainians can find protection in European Union. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite to the floor for the opening remarks uh, Honourable Head of the Representation to Ireland, Barbara Nolan. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah, and um, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to see such a good turnout for such a good uh, and interesting uh, topic of discussion. Uh, I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to my colleagues, uh, Lisa Gerasco and Claire Cronin, uh, the two ambassadors who are also co-sponsoring this event. Um, maybe before we do a deep dive into, you know, the heavy duty disinformation, I'd like to start with some good news, which is, of course, that just last week there was a very important uh, milestone in Ukraine, Ukraine's and indeed Moldova's also uh, path towards EU membership. Um, as, as many of you know, on the 8th of November, uh, the Commission recommended that the European Council open accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova, with formal talks to begin as soon as they have adopted certain key uh, measures. Um, the Commission has promised to report uh, on progress by March 2024, so congratulations to Ukraine and Moldova and indeed also to Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, the latter two which were recommended for candidate status. So we are looking forward to uh, a very interesting uh, time ahead uh, as these countries move towards joining uh, the European Union. The next step, of course, will be for the heads of state and government to back the Commission's enlargement recommendation when they meet for their regular summit in December. Um, uh, and I hope that since they're meeting on my birthday, that that's some kind of a good sign uh, for, for, for the future. Anyway, since today the focus is, in, is on Ukraine, I would like to echo the words of President von der Leyen who said that the people of Ukraine are European and that it is our dream to bring Ukraine into the European Union. So I'd just like to start with that. Uh... So I'm now turning to, to, to the Ambassador of the United States, uh, Claire Cronin, and I'm delighted that she is participating in this event today. The EU has been working closely on disinformation with colleagues from uh, different parts of the US administration for many years. This cooperation is taking place both bilaterally and uh, within frameworks such as the G7 rapid response mechanism, and it has proven to be highly useful. The EU-US Trade and Technology Council includes a work strand on 
foreign information manipulation and interference, including disinformation. And I think this gives an added impetus for EU-US cooperation uh, in the international fora. Our cooperation aims to support like-minded partners in countering foreign information manipulation and interference while safeguarding freedom of expression uh, together with our partner countries. And the EU is keen to cooperate further with the United States on the topic of foreign information manipulation and interference to find joint and effects, effective responses to this very worrying uh, threat. Let me turn now to disinformation uh, and uh, what the, the, the European Commission has been doing most recently uh, in this area. First of all, there's a lot of dis different terminology uh, used, uh, disinformation, misinformation, fake news, propaganda, negative campaigning. Uh, sometimes the differences are obvious, but sometimes they are subtle, even for those who are actively engaged uh, in the field. However, whatever we call it, we are here today to talk about the manipulation of information uh, to mislead or deceive people. I think we could all agree that that is what we want that we want to look at today. This information in general, and specifically that link to the Russian war in, in Ukraine, is an issue of concern for the EU, as it can have a strong impact on democracy and how it operates. It's widely believed that Russian influence affected the, had an impact on the Brexit vote in the UK in 2016. The UK government has acknowledged that there was Russian interference in the 2014 referendum on Scottish independence uh, and, uh, on that, and on the December 2019 UK general election. Disinformation seeks to disrupt and influence regular political processes in a malign and coordinated manner and sway public opinion and erode trust in our democratic institutions. Recent events in the Middle East have raised the stakes even higher. The widespread dissemination of illegal content uh, and disinformation uh, linked to the conflict carries a clear risk of stigmatizing certain communities and destabilizing our democratic structures. And this is of particular concern to us in the European Union at the moment in the run-up to the European elections next year, uh, which will take place in June of next year. Uh, while Europe is preparing to vote, the threats against our democratic processes, <laughs> including disinformation and information manipulation campaigns, have to be high on our radar. So how are we responding at EU level uh, to uh, what has been going on in this area? We are tackling the spread of online disinformation and misinformation uh, to ensure the protection of European values and our democratic systems. With the Digital Services Act and the EU Code of Practice on Disinformation, the EU has created the most advanced framework in the world to tackle the threat of disinformation. Taking decisive action to fight disinformation risks, uh, uh, disinformation risks is no longer a voluntary exercise, but an obligation now under the Digital Services Act. Um, an independent report published in August this year found that in 2022, tech companies' efforts to limit the Kremlin's malign activities on their platforms were insufficient. Uh, the report analyzed systematic sorry, systemic risks caused by pro-Kremlin disinformation on six online platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, uh, TikTok, and Telegram. In the words of Reporters Without Borders, the Digital Services Act, our new piece of very strong legislation, will finally impose order on the practices of an industry that draws its wealth from the information chaos it, ge it generates. So under the Digital Services Act, the Commission will become the regulator for very large online platforms and search engines. It will monitor the systems that such online platforms put into place to tackle illegal content and disinformation and protect users. 
In order to do so, the Commission is equipped, has been equipped with wide ranging investigatory and supervisory powers, including the powers to impose sanctions, significant sanctions, financial sanctions and remedies. So since uh, the end of August this year, obligations under the Digital Services Act have already started to apply for the first uh, very large platforms that have been designated very large online platforms. These online platforms ha have more than 45 million users in the EU, which is around 10% of the total population of the EU. So entities such as Microsoft, Google, Meta, TikTok have submitted their first risk assessment reports, including mitigation measures for risks related to disinformation. And the Commission's enforcement team is currently examining these. In September, uh, we also have a code of practice, uh, and in September, the code of practice submitted a new round of reports to the Commission covering the period January to June 2023. And these reports included a specific chapter on actions to, re to reduce disinformation in the context of Russia's war on Ukraine. So let me share just a couple of interesting findings from these reports. In the first half of 2023, Google prevented more than 31 million of advertising from flowing to disinformation actors in the EU. Between March and June 2023, TikTok removed close to 5.9 million fake accounts, which had more than 47.4 million uh, followers. Microsoft reported that it had removed 20, over 24,000 pieces of content from, from LinkedIn for violation of its misinformation policies. And Meta reported that 95% of users encountering content with a warning label that the information has been fact-checked as false, chose not to click on it, which is heartening to hear. Uh, Meta also signals that 37% of users on Facebook and 38% on Instagram who intend to share fact-checked content opt to cancel their sharing action when receiving a warning. So things are beginning to kick in in terms of alerting people to uh, misinformation. Uh, the Commission is also supporting the work of the European Digital Media Observatory, which is creating a cross-border and multidisciplinary community of independent fact-checkers, academic researchers and media literary, uh, literacy practi practitioners. They collaborate to detect, analyse and expose potential disinformation threats and raise media and information literacy. The observatory and its national hubs are instrumental in the fight against disinformation and they have contributed significantly in the context of Russia's uh, war against Ukraine. A first pilot project in Spain, Portugal Slova and Slovakia uh, by code of conduct signatories uh, found that 40% of Twitter content was disinformation, 40% and that almost 10% of Twitter users were disinformation actors. So, you know, we're doing a lot, but despite all of these actions to tackle disinformation, we are fully aware that we're only reaching the tip of the iceberg. Um, and that's why cooperation with like-minded partners, with Ukraine, with the United States, is really important. We need a coordinated and targeted response to be effective in the fight against disinformation. I think we all know that peace and democracy are not, uh, are not a given. We must remain vigilant and, let, and not let inf disinformation divide us or undermine our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really interesting and important statistics. And I think that there are very few people who are not online users. And of course, it's important that the information that we see online is verified and checked. Thank you. Once again, I would like to emphasize that this event uh, became possible thanks to uh, excellent partnership and support uh, with the United States Embassy in Dublin. And United States support Ukraine and Ukrainian people 
and it's this support is essential for Ukraine's victory and for our country's democratic future. And it's my big honor and pleasure to give the floor to Ambassador of the United States to Ireland, Claire Croning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador Jurasco, uh, Barbara Nolan, and also to Hannah Bazilo for organizing this wonderful event. We are delighted to partner with you. And I wanted to welcome all of you here uh, at Europe House and those who are joining us online. It is an understatement to say that we live in incredibly challenging times. The horror of Russia's unjust and unprovoked war against Ukraine continues as another winter begins. Our prayers go out to civilians around the world in Ukraine Israel, and Gaza, who have been kidnapped, killed, or injured, and those who have lost loved ones to conflict. We are heartbroken by every innocent life that is lost. And it's in times like these that I'm grateful that we can gather to explore how to work together as friends and partners to address these global crises. The United States is proud to stand with our partners across Europe in our support for Ukraine as it protects its people and fights for its freedom. President Biden has made clear that winning the war means a complete withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine's internationally recognized borders. The United States will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes so you can Ukraine can continue to defend itself and be in the strongest possible position at the negotiating table when the time comes. One of the ways that Russia tries to splinter our unified support is through disinformation, spreading lies to advance the Kremlin's policy goals. The Kremlin aims to interject chaos into the information sphere confusing global audiences about Russia's real actions and intentions in Ukraine, Georgia, and elsewhere. The themes of Russia's disinformation are expansive, from propaganda about Russia's kidnapping and illegal detention of Ukraine's children, to lies about Russia's decision to terminate its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative which jeopardized global food security. We know of Russia's efforts to undermine public confidence in elections and democracies throughout the world, but especially here in Europe. We also know that one of the most effective ways to counter Russia's schemes are to expose them. By shining a light on this activity and by providing concrete and actionable information, we hope to promote awareness and resilience. This is a global challenge, and the community of democracies must remain united in our collective defense of election integrity. As President Biden said, there is truth and there are lies. Lies told for power and for profit. And each of us has a duty and responsibility to defend the truth and to defeat the lies. And that is why we are here today, to defend the truth, to highlight Russia's propaganda campaigns, to bring together experts from Ukraine, Ireland, the United States, and across Europe, and to work towards our shared goal of supporting Ukraine. More than 20 months after Russia's full-scale invasion, President Putin's war on Ukraine continues to result in extraordinary costs. Thousands of civilians killed or wounded, thousands more subjected to forced deportation, sexual violence, and torture. Millions forced to flee their homes, and cities pounded to rubble. 
the United States will continue to support the government and people of Ukraine in their courageous fight to defend their nation. We will work with our friends and partners to ensure that Russia's invasion is a strategic defeat. Ukraine must not only survive, it must thrive, strong enough to deter and defend against aggressors and with a vibrant, prosperous democracy within its borders. In closing, I want to thank all of you for your ongoing support for Ukraine, your incredible generosity to those displaced by Russia, and your contributions to this very important discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Your words are touching our hearts. How special it is to know that Ukrainians are supported and how important it is to know that Ukraine is uniting people, countries, continents, and the whole world to achieve this victory. And as you said, not just to survive, but to strive. Thank you very much. I have a great privilege to speak today on behalf of Ukrainian community in Ireland, which is reaching out to almost 100,000 people who are seeking protection from war and Russian bombs elsewhere. Our mission uh, is to be the Ukrainian voice and action in Ireland. And it's a privilege to have such a team of dedicated volunteers who find time to support their communities in the times of needs, to uh, give their time, expertise, and knowledge to bring uh, the events like this, but also to do different community building world uh, events and to protest and also to find the ways to bring Ukrainian and Irish communities closer together. And one of our strengths is, of course, information and social media as a channel to spread this information. Um, we have conducted two um, surveys of Ukrainians in Ireland, uh, asking them about their, how they're settling here, why they chose Ireland, and what are their future plans. One of the questions that we asked is, what is the main source of information? Where do you receive the information about everything? And we learned that 68% of Ukrainians in Ireland get their information from social media, and one of the first one is Telegram. And this is also compared to only 50% getting them from official government websites and 26 from mass media. So we see a shift and we see where the potential is lying. And we know that social media, it's very hard to know what is going on there. Moreover, we learned in this survey that people are eager to trust their neighbor uh, next door more than any official information, which means that anyone who believes that something is true can influence their community. That's why one of our missions as an organization was to check and post only verified and truthful information so that Ukrainians in Ireland people who are vulnerable because they had to flee their homes, because they do not speak the language, because they are in a totally new country where they know nobody and nothing, actually have the truthful information and rely on it. And we are very proud to say that the survey also reveals that uh, our social media channels are visited by half of the population uh, who found protection from war in Ireland. So I just wanted to say it to highlight how important this discussion is, not just for um, people who are working on this, but also for the common people who are users of this information. 
And it's my big, big privilege and honor that we managed to secure and bring such a wonderful experts to this room today and also online to share their insights, their expertise, their studies. It's incredible uh, information and, and sources and data that will be presented to you today. And I just want to say once again, thank you for making this event possible. Thank you for attending. And without any further ado, to leave a floor to more questions and, and presentations, I would like to invite ambassadors to join uh, the room and to invite our first panel to the floor. So while we are changing the seats, I would like to announce the moderator of our first panel, Dr. Tanya Lokot, who is an associate professor in digital media and society at the School of Communications at Dublin City University. She's a native of Ukraine, and she researches threats to digital rights, networked authoritarianism, online disinformation, digital resistance, and information freedom. Tanya, we are delighted to have you with us, and I give you the floor to moderate the panel from wherever you choose. Thank you, Hannah. I'll start from here and I'll take my seat um, and then hopefully people who want to capture photos will also be able to capture photos. Um, so as Hannah said, uh, my name is Tanya Lockhart. Um, I represent Dublin City University um, and we are thrilled to kick off um, our first panel uh, after such wonderful introductions and interventions from um, our ambassadors and the head of the European Commission representation in Ireland. Um, as you can see from your program, the title of the panel is Methods, Instruments and Tactics of Russia's Information Warfare Worldwide. Uh, so in our panel, we will do our best to uh, provide a thorough overview of what it is that we're dealing with when we talk about Russian disinformation. Um, and fortunately, we have a great panel of experts um, joining us today in person and online. Um, so joining me on this panel are um, Anaid Hoperia, who is head of the Department for Countering Disinformation Threats to National Security uh, from the Center for Countering Disinformation at the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. Uh, joining us online, we also have Martina Biljukevich, head of East Stratcom Task Force European External Action Service. And uh, we also have David Salvo, who is a senior fellow and managing director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy at uh, GMF. So we're going, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start by um, having each speaker um, deliver their um, 10, 12, 15 minute uh, intervention. Um, and then uh, we'll also um, have the opportunity for questions. Um, obviously, the speakers can ask questions uh, of each other, but then we will also open it to the floor uh, for more questions and answers. Uh, so without further ado, I will um, let um, Anait go first, and I will let her set the scene for us, uh, because I think it's really important to understand uh, and hear firsthand kind of from from the front line uh, of uh, fighting Russian disinformation. Um, so I'm sure Anait will, will give us um, the down low on uh, what is going on and what it is that Ukraine and Ukrainian officials are dealing with. And then we'll continue to our other speakers. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and uh, I'm. It's, it's, a, it's an honor, really honor, to be here. Uh, even everybody is interested in our practice, but it's also a pleasure to 
share this practice with me if you are interested. Uh, so uh, regarding our center and how we are countering this information, uh, can, next, can next slide, please. Uh, I will just give short overview of what we are doing in our center. And uh, we are a new born center, just uh, we were created in 2021 by the de decision of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. And uh, our provisions uh, were, were signed by presidential decree. And, uh, President Zelensky created us. He mentioned that in future, he wants to see us as an international hub of countering disinformation. But well, he somehow forecasted. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, somehow forecasted uh, that uh, we will be in the middle of all this uh, countering this information process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, about our operational activity, I can say that it is divided on two uh, on four uh, directions. Uh, first of all, analytical uh, and public. Uh, an analytical was the the main because uh, as uh, we were established as an analytical center, somehow very closely to global engagement center in US, some, some, some way. But we slightly changed our directions. Uh, and please, next slide. So about analytical more deeply. Uh, why I'm in the slide, you can see a unique system of detection, assessment, and response to information threats. Why it is unique? When we were, create, uh, were created, uh, we, uh, with the help of uh, the embassy of uh, United Kingdom, uh, they helped us to make this roadmap, how we should work, and uh, they give uh, really nice uh, information about different countries, how they counter inf information threats, and uh, we used with this system, of course, and the Lithuanians uh, also uh, practice was very close to ours. But why it is unique? Because we slightly changed after full-scale war. Uh, we understood that we cannot um, just sit, you know, and uh, assess is it a high level of the uh, information thread that we should respond or not. Almost every information threat that we got, we, we needed to respond. That's why uh, after full-scale war, we slightly changed our um, work and our direction. Uh, also, uh, what we do, we accumulate and process all monitoring from the Ukrainian state and regional bodies, because we have such a mandate to request all monitorings, and and we can see the whole picture, what is actually happening in our country. Additionally, we do our monitoring, uh, which also helps to our uh, state institutions to uh, counter effectively uh, disinformation. Uh, so uh, also we uh, monitor the international information sphere, of course, uh, information threats that aim of discrediting Ukraine. Uh, beside that, we also monitor people who second in Russian narratives, uh, we understand that most countries cannot do pretty much nothing about it because, you know, sim simply they still um, comparing this to freedom of speech, etc. But, you know, these people who uh, intensively doing this and uh, second in Russian narratives and sometimes they work for Russia to, to do this, there is nothing compared, and it is nothing to do with journalism and uh, expertise, etc. They are just doing their work for Russia. Next slide, please. Also, what we do, and we of course uh, uh, do uh, weekly reports for our state institutions, and also we share these weekly reports uh, to our partners, what is happening in Ukraine, uh, highlights of the week, and also we give uh, the narratives which uh, were spread in different international uh, information sources, uh, so our partners could see what is, how, how our, our country discredited in their uh, information sources. 
also information cards of response. What it is, it's uh, the uh, small card, one pager. Uh, when we see some information threat, we send to, to the ministry or state institutions, whatever, which were uh, jeopardized yes, by the uh, information threat. And um, why we done this in the, in the very uh, not typical way, uh, because before full scale war, uh, we uh, sent these big, huge reports, and nobody were <laughs> reading it. Uh, this, you know, because we have a bunch of information. We cannot like read everything. It's normal. But after full scale war, we understood that we need to, you know, to point it to make it like alarm, and then they could, and then we give recommendations. You could communicate. You could monitor or ask us. We will mo monitor. Uh, uh, this information threat uh, against your organization, uh, or we can make some proactive work together. Uh, so it's, I think, the also a uh, positive thing that we've done. Uh, dossier on propagandists. This looks like, a, you know, like censorship or something, but uh, what is actually is, uh, our, we are working with special services. They already do this. They already uh, make dossiers against people who, uh, you know, uh, make some collaboration uh, in, in our country. And that's why we, uh, we also monitor this information field. And we see these people even more and even deeply because we monitor mostly Telegram channels, of course, because it's the most popular information source in our country. And sometimes we see administrators who are behind some Telegram channels or... Uh, some people in our country who, you know, discredited and want to destabilize our country internally. And that's why we sent this uh, dossier, and because of our work, more than 15 people were in section list. Uh, and uh, also, there were often criminal investigations against these people, but I cannot mention how many because it's still ongoing. Uh, so also, we use more, uh, a lot of softwares, even uh, one of the software which, which helps us to monitor Telegram channels uh, made, was made by our Ukrainian volunteers, our IT specialists. They made um, for us with IE system, and our analysts teach this IE system uh, to be more effective as a software. And also, we use different OSIN tools, Humint. It also helps our work, uh, to develop our work. work. And... Uh, Technic tactics procedures, you know, it's a classical thing that everybody is doing, and we also, of course, doing that. Next slide, please. Uh, also, before I will go to the public direction, I just need to say that uh, big tech companies also helps us a lot. Uh, for example, with Google, we uh, uh, blocked a lot of YouTube channels in our country, which violated our uh, Articles of our legislation, and uh, also we uh, working with, uh, closely with NGOs who are official fact checkers of Meta in our country. There are two of them: Vox Check and Stop Fake. And we give a bunch of materials to them just to you know to somehow uh, flag that and mark that this is disinformation. Uh, with X, not so closely. Uh, community notes helps us a lot, but. Uh, directly with the, uh, with the speaker. Uh, also, we adapt in FEMI for in, uh, in information manipulation influence with the help of European Union Advisory Mission. Uh, we asked uh, from the, uh, representatives from the EES to give us uh, trainings about it. So we also doing everything to be in the, you know, in the same page with our European part partners. And I know that the Global Engagement Center also adopted FEMI. So uh, that's why we want to use the same taxonomy, the same terminology, you know, to be on the same page. About public direction. Uh, honestly, never thought that we will do this. But after full scale war, uh, our people were like, literally in the basement, and they didn't understand what is actually happening. And the uh, Russian main point was just to make our, our panic, to destabilize situation inside, and, you know, just to surrender. Uh, that's why we understood that we need to communicate, and not just we, 
you know, our special services also communicate a lot. Uh, it is a unique thing to do this, but still, uh, I think it's a progressive way to uh, build communication with people. That's why we became state fact checker in our country. <coughs> because of our Telegram channels, YouTube, Instagram, even TikTok, we have TikToks even, just to, you know, to communicate what is actually happening and um, somehow to uh, counter some campaigns that is coming to our country. Next slide, please. International cooperation is another direction. Uh, this organizations which we are working with and uh, we have another ones uh, that we are working because we understand that uh, Unfortunately, our country discredited abroad, and uh, we need to build the same strategy, the, the, the strategy how to counter it together. And for example, as you know, Poland is under attack uh, every time. And Radova Centrum Bezpieczeństwa, we debunked more than five big disinformation campaigns against uh, Poland, Poland uh, uh, Ukrainian relationship that, uh, you know, Russians wants to make uh, harder. Uh, that's why we understood that we need to work with every state institutions that uh, exist in, in the world. And uh, be because of this, we constantly work on building relationship. That's why we are very open, transparent, and I'm happy to talk uh, more about it. Uh, next slide. Educational direction. Uh, this direction came up because of request. Uh, when uh, it was, I think, May, uh, summer, and you know, our pupils, uh, they didn't had chance to educate normally because of full-scale war. And uh, our teachers asked us, gave the request, maybe you could give materials to make cartoons for our people, children. Uh, and we made it, and we understood that why not? We have a big amount of practice and uh, case studies. We can show uh, people about what it is exactly, what is information bubble, what is bots, uh, disinformation uh, as itself. So we started work on media literacy too. And we <coughs> made a lot of trainings for our state representatives, for students, for regional bodies, etc., and uh, we made manual on countering disinformation with uh, the support of European Union advisory mission in Ukraine. So we still continue to do this because we got a lot of requests about, uh, during uh, regarding this. Uh, before we will go to the next slide, I just need to mention that uh, a lot of questions we got: what changed from 2022 on this information field? I mean. To 2023. I just can mention that Russians were uh, focused only on our country uh, at the beginning and uh, they wanted to destabilize somehow our, you know, cohesion. And uh, after that, they understood that the main point is to discredit us in your eyes, in Western partners, uh, etc. That's why. Um, with the help uh, with different influencers, etc., we make uh, different projects. And one of them with the civil society was Fox Check. Uh, we um, made videos about people who constantly second in Russian narratives. And also they had a separate project uh, uh, propaganda diary. And uh, they mentioned that... Uh, they monitor six countries, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Germany, Italy, and top three narratives there uh, from the Russian side exists is uh, West controls Ukraine and use them for its uh, own purpose purposes. Ukraine and West actions forced Russia to start the war, uh, support Ukraine, hurt or damaged the West more than Russia. And... Uh, we also fix such narratives because we made uh, we make these monitorings uh, different about different countries, not just these six ones. And 
while we are monitoring, we see that in 2022 and 2023, it became even more. The fake messages, fake materials, uh, videos, cartoons, advertisements, uh, and even we, uh, we use this information alibi uh, that Russia is using. It's like fake pre-banking, you know. Okay, I'm just ending. <laughs> uh, so why we... Uh, why I'm talking about it, because the next slide, please. Uh, we want to talk about Ireland, how Russia can be, even you don't see it, but Russia can influence uh, Ireland too. Next slide, please. Few, just two uh, campaigns. First, on March 8, 2022, uh, an article entitled United Nations Advises Tough Against Using War or Invasion Regarding Ukraine was published on the website of the Irish Times. Uh, the article stated that UN staff were allegedly being instructed to use the words conflict or military offensive instead of the words war and invasion uh, in relation to Ukraine. At the same time, the Irish Times journalists referred to a document said to UN employees by the communication department of the organization. Also, according to the article, the UN allegedly prohibited its employees from using Ukrainian flags on uh, profiles in social networks or websites in order to avoid reputation risk. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, Russian used it uh, because Irish Times publi published it and uh, using Telegram channels wherever, in every website they can they could use. Next slide, please. And uh, here is spokesman of UN, uh, of course, debunked it, and he said that this is not true. It is simply not the case that staff have been instructed. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, the conclusion is that Irish Times became a victim of Russian disinformation because um, they used the fake letter, is the uh, popular uh, tool of Russian disinformation. And as you see in the graphics, it's a Telegram channel graphic, uh, Telegram channel software that we are using. It shows, you know, how uh, inauthentically it became so popular, uh, this uh, campaign. Uh, next slide, please. This is the second uh, campaign. It was this year, in September 2023, a document in English dated September 7, 2023, allegedly from the Ministry of Justice of Ireland, was published, which refers to the extradition of Ukrainian from Ireland. The reason given is the man is cons conscripted is, and is hiding from serving in the armed forces. Uh, so, uh, what the interesting point here? It's you see that Ministry of Justice of Ireland wrote this. Uh, next slide, please. The original source, Nairland Forum, is Nigerian. <laughs> so, yes, it may be uh, funny to talk, but the last, for example, every time the, uh, our first lady go visit some countries, the, the same disinformation campaign starts that she had the fancy shopping and she uh, spent a lot of money on different countries, etc. And three last uh, campaigns that were uh, mentioned from uh, uh, because of us started from Nigeria because they invested Russian invested a lot of money in Africa and Nigeria and sources just to start these information campaigns from there not from Russia next slide uh, so uh, this Russians used this uh, of course materials that uh, you need uh, you see even Ireland like uh, want to uh, how to say, to send the Ukrainians, yes, yes. Uh, next slide, please, to send Ukrainians back. And Irish Times now uh, debunked it, of course. Uh, they, they used uh, the, the uh, Department of Justice, uh, men they, they mentioned, confirmed that it was not behind the letters, which were sent to an unknown number of men. Next slide, please. So the conclusion is that Russia propaganda exists everywhere, <laughs> even in Ireland, even in a neutral country, which uh, really not into this, but still Russia will do everything just to, you know, to impact 
uh, every country to destabilize uh, our relationship with every country that support us. And, uh, you know, this fake letter, the last one that I mentioned, it was not just in Ireland that uh, this campaign, it was in European countries as Poland, Latvia, and Lithuania. So they used even the same materials uh, in different countries, uh, but in different languages. For in Poland, it was uh, in Polish uh, from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of Poland. They wrote that uh, Ukraine should be extradited. extradited. So, yes, um, it's just to show what is actually happening. Thank you very much. Uh, from, from your presentation, there's obviously a lot of interesting tidbits, but um, for me what stands out is the importance of, of doing day-to-day -day research and monitoring and obviously also developing that shared common language with international partners that actually helps to see trends and patterns. And I think this is actually a great segue to our next speaker, uh, Martina Biljukevic, uh, who will talk about the work that Eastratcom Task Force and the EU versus Disinfo team do in doing exactly that, in, in trying to find those patterns and trying to monitor and develop um, infrastructures and categorizations for, for the types of um, disinformation and specifically Russian disinformation that are the subject of, of our event today. Uh, Martina, thank you for joining us online and the floor is yours. Hello from Brussels. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I can see people can see me as well. <laughs> uh, so please just bear with me while I share my screen. Uh, there, there are a few pieces of information that I would like to um, share with you. So given the logic of and I travel, uh, traveling so long and having a longer presentation, I wasn't traveling to you, unfortunately, so I should be brief, I guess. Uh, and I will try to do exactly that. Um, so what I want to um, focus my presentation on is, I hope you can hear my, uh, see my slides now. Um, so what I want to focus on is really, sorry about that, uh, how disinformation narratives have changed or have they really changed in the last few years and where the biggest challenge uh, in fight against females these days. So, I've been head of East Stratcom Task Force for um, over two years now, and I've been in the task force for more than four years. So I, I like to say sometimes that I've seen it all. And as far as disinformation narratives are concerned, so as far as what the Kremlin and the whole PME, Russian PME ecosystem is saying is concerned, I get bored, I have to admit. And uh, this is because as far as disinformation narratives are concerned, this is very much repetitive. Uh, here on the slide, you can see one example of that. Um, these are excerpts from EU versus Disinfo database uh, from different years, as you can see. Uh, and the disinformation narratives are about um, Ukraine supplying, uh, well, using the weapons they got from the West to uh, incite conflicts elsewhere or to cause harm elsewhere. And you can see an example uh, of Kiev, allegedly this is original Russian um, spelling. So this is why it, it is like that. In the 2016 case, Kiev is supplying ISIS with weapons in Aleppo. But uh, the um, most fresh iterations of these narratives are about Western weapons that were given to Ukraine by, by allies um, to, respond to full-scale invasion, how they are being used uh, on sold on darknet or how they are used to kill civilians in Africa or also how they are used to uh, fuel tensions in France around the Yellow Vests protests. So this is, uh, we can see a pattern because we run a um, database of disinformation narratives. We have been doing that since 2015. We can see clear patterns of lying and manipulating by Russia and using the same narrative over and over again. Another example is about uh, those notorious biological laboratories. I'm quite sure you have heard this before. Um, so according to Russia, there are biological laboratories in Ukraine, but also in Georgia, in Armenia, uh, that are um, funded by the American money. And, and this is the grain of truth part of this narrative, because there are actually such laboratories in those countries. 
but they focus on biological research. Uh, whereas what Russia is saying is that uh, those labs are working on biological weapons that are supposed to kill, for example, people of Russian ethnicity only. So I always say when I use this example that this sounds a little bit like in the last James Bond movie and uh, and so it gives this sense of conspiracy around it and also um, an element of pop culture. Um, but as you can see on the slide here, this narrative is also as well older than our database really and the first um, examples of such disinformation narratives um, we found already in 2014 and they were repeated over and over again. Last year they actually traveled globally, they were quite popular in Asia, they were popular in some environments in the US as well. And then the third example of twisting the same narrative over and over again is about immigrants. So when um, the European Union experienced an immigration crisis uh, a few years ago from the south of Europe, um, the main narrative pushed by Russia was that uh, the refugees, the immigrants that are coming, um, are going to be closed in concentration camps that the EU is going to build and fund. Um, but there were many others because, uh, as I'm sure many of you know very, very well, um, Russia's disinformation, Russia's information manipulation is really about pursuing just one narrative. Um, different narratives about immigrants uh, were used uh, when uh, Belarus incited crisis at the border between the EU and Belarus. Um, in 2021, uh, there is an example of this on your right hand side, but obviously um, Russia also used the opportunity of its own full scale invasion of Ukraine and when uh, refugees started flowing in to Poland and other countries of the European Union, it also um, used similar disinformation narratives um, to target uh, Ukraine and to target those countries. Um, just one more example in the same vein is of the so-called threatened values. This is one of the meta-narratives, one of the basic uh, narratives that Russia has been using for years to target different countries. And I think this slide shows very well how uh, the same uh, type of narrative is being used in different audiences, in different languages, to different countries. And I chose those countries specifically because, uh, so these are the countries of the Eastern neighborhood uh, of the European Union because they are mostly targeted with, with this narrative of um, of threatened values of how um, any kind of cooperation with the West actually causes the, the total the granulate and uh, collapse of of the world as we know it of traditional values um, because of the of what the West and the EU uh, are bringing with with themselves. So what I just shared with you for those few minutes can be summarized actually in this very slide. Um, so uh, whatever Kremlin is spinning can be actually summarized here and the, the spiral of disinformation narratives just goes on and on and on. And Russia, because it also has been using disinformation and FEMI for so many years uh, globally, uh, it has a lot of experience and can tailor particular narratives to different audiences and picking also events uh, as they are happening to do just that. Nevertheless, from my perspective, um, as far as the information narratives are concerned, this is highly, highly predictable, which is, I think, making our job a little bit easier um, because if we can show patterns, uh, if we can explain that, you know, this manipulative narrative has been used before so many times, um, we can explain that way to a wider audience that, uh, that uh, it's an ecosystem uh, that we are up against. However, where the main challenge uh, still is um, these days is in tactics, techniques and procedures. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, we definitely need to keep countering disinformation narratives and we do this in East Stratcom Task Force via EU versus Disinfo and, and other instruments, which perhaps I will have the opportunity to talk about later on. Um, nevertheless, uh, we can predict those narratives. We can pre-bank, we can debunk, we can um, increase the resilience towards narratives uh, of our communities. where. Uh, 
there is a bigger challenge, challenge is in TTP, so tactics, techniques, procedures, uh, excuse the abbreviation. I hope this will be one of the very few ones no, we'll I'm going see to see if Martina can get her sound back. Uh, yeah. While she's doing it, we'll of course all know who we can blame the sound, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, has something happened? Yeah, Martina, if you could mute and unmute because we lost uh, your sound there. So I'm not sure if it's your headphones and microphone or... I don't know, honestly. Um, is this any better? Well, hopefully she can hear us. I do, I, I can hear you and... She's uh, trying muting and muting, but it doesn't seem to be doing much okay so the problem is in the room apparently let's see um, hey, hey. Uh, we don't hear you in the room uh, but we hear you in the call uh, give us several seconds to figure out what's wrong so i think it's probably then on our side mm. it's all right we've gone this far without major technical issues i think we can we can afford this one. It's also a really engaging slide, so uh, we can we can uh, all take notes from the TTPs. Oh, wow. Can you hear us? Oh, we can see her. Can we hear her? Can you hear me? Nope. No, Mar Martina says uh, in the meeting, but we don't hear you. Huh. Mm. Can Can you try just okay. reconnect? back i will yeah we'll give it another minute or two yes Ma martina is recording uh, maybe this yeah i help. think i think perhaps um while we do that um if if uh, we can maybe go to david meanwhile and then uh we can come back to martina because i think she's kind of stopped at a really uh nice point um so David, while, while uh, Martina is reconnecting, if you could uh, sort of maybe pick up on some of the themes that you've heard, uh, but also maybe to take us um, to um, a slightly different uh, geographical context and, and talk a little bit about uh, how you see this, uh, this playing out um, in the American uh, context. Sure, my pleasure, and I'm sorry that I have to be the voice that interrupts such an interesting presentation, um, but I'll try to be brief in case Martina joins us. Uh, first of all, great to see you all. Thanks to the Commission and the embassies and Ukrainian Action for sponsoring this event. It's an honor to be in Dublin. My name is David Salvo. I'm the Managing Director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy at the German Marshall Fund. We study autocratic efforts to undermine democracy. A big area of our, of our focus, of course, is disinformation, information manipulation. We have various online tools that track Russian state-sponsored uh, media outlets and government outlets and how they are messaging to European and American audiences. A lot of my presentation will focus on the data we've collected about messaging relating to the war in Ukraine, targeting both EU and American audiences. In addition, I'd also like to talk about how Russian state-sponsored messengers are exploiting loopholes on various social media platforms. We've heard a lot about that already from Barbara Nolan. I'd like to discuss some more data to show how messages are still getting across despite good efforts to take down Russian propaganda uh, and, and restrict access to European and American audiences. So Russia started its information war in the United States specifically really on the back foot. Um, and this is largely due to the fact that the Biden administration, to its credit, spent a lot of political capital declassifying intelligence to unmask Russian lies about the invasion. Um, so Russia, had, with little credibility Russia had, it had already lost when it lied and lied about whether it was going to invade, and the Biden administration clearly presented evidence to the contrary. This also generated broad bipartisan support in the United States for supporting Ukraine initially. And oddly enough, the Kremlin's information messaging, its information manipulation at that time, focused more on conspiracy theories that really didn't resonate with American audiences. So we've heard a lot about various conspiracy theories, the Biolabs conspiracy, the, the false flag at Bucha, that the atrocities at Bucha didn't happen. 
These were arguments and narratives that Russia really doubled down on in the first six months of the war in their English language messaging towards Americans and even Europeans, the denazification of Ukraine. This really fell on deaf ears. Um, yeah, there were some blips in the mainstream media where Tucker Carlson, for example, on Fox News spread the bio news, the bio labs conspiracy, but it didn't stick. We even analyzed podcasts where nearly a quarter of Americans get their news, thinking that maybe fringe arguments would really percolate in that information ecosystem. We analyzed roughly 2,000 podcast episodes about the war in Ukraine in the first year of the war, and only about 5% either explicitly or implicitly supported Russian narratives on some of the more crazier conspiracy theories. Well, that's me. No, I thought Martina was back. <laughs> so... Uh, actually, uh, we don't know whether Martina is able to speak. Please continue, and we figure after uh, your presentation. Great. Thank you. So after about six months of really shouting into the wind, Russia's information strategy had to change. They focused on the costs of the war on the West, and this became very apparent. They were changing their messaging after about six months in Europe and in the United States, messaging on the energy crisis in Europe went up 267%. So 267% more tweets by Russian state-sponsored media and government outlets on the energy crisis compared to the first six months of the war. Tweets about sanctions backfiring on the West or about inflation in the United States were, they went up from roughly like I don't know, 500,000 to a million to about 3 million in that same period. So it was a significant spike in doubling down on that sort of narrative that the West is ultimately going to pay for its support for Ukraine. And it was around this time in the United States, about the six month mark, that you began to hear the first rumblings of dissent about whether to continue supporting, for, supporting Ukraine over the long term. And this is not just an argument that resonates in one segment of American society. On both the far left and the far right, there are arguments historically against this type of interventionism. On the right, it's more isolationism and redirecting resources towards American people. On the left, it's more about um, the, the, the problems related to American hegemony overseas and, and interventionism. And what was interesting is around this time, we were preparing for a midterm election campaign in 2020, 2022. What we did was analyze all candidate statements on the war of Ukraine to see just how, how much the Russian narrative might actually be entering the American political lexicon. And you might be surprised to hear that at least at that time, not that much. So the overwhelming majority of social media statements on the war of Ukraine by candidates of both parties were overwhelmingly in support of maintaining US uh, assistance to Ukraine. However, roughly 90% of the most engaged with comments were against supporting Ukraine. So the minority was the loudest voice in the room. And this is of course a problem of social media, of course, but this is when debate in the United States really began to change. Now, some of this, of course, there's a correlation with Russian information messaging um, campaigns, but some of it, of course, is organic debate in, in the United States. And as the 2024 presidential election began to kick off in earnest, those voices that were once sort of in the fringe minority became louder and louder. They received more coverage. And now we have sort of an open debate about, you know, whether, um, if there is a next U.S. administration that, that's, that's different from the current one, whether it will support Ukraine. I do believe that support for Ukraine still has predominantly bipartisan support. You still hear the loudest voices that are against it, though, and that's part of the problem. So that's shaping the messaging. And since I, I said I wanted to talk about social media and how that's sort of exacerbating the problem, there really are some serious ways in which the Russian narrative continues to make its way to American European audiences, exploiting loopholes in all the platforms that um, that we know and love or don't love so well. So on Twitter and Meta, despite attempts to take down RT accounts in European languages, 
there is a loophole, and that is Russia created alternative accounts or reactivated dormant accounts and simply repurposed RT content with, under different names that went, uh, that, that continued to operate without any intervention from Twitter and Meta. This was particularly egregious in the Spanish language, which has problems, which creates problems for the United States and Latin America in particular, um, where Latin American uh, countries don't ban RT as it is. And in the Spanish language, RT in Espanol is already the single most engaged with foreign so Spanish language news source. So there are all these ways that, that Russia is trying to compete with the United States in areas of the world that we care about and in the Spanish language, which matters for US domestic electoral purposes as well. So even in 2022, this spin-off of Count of RT in Espanol became this, the fastest growing state media page on Twitter and Facebook. And then there's of course the other sort of global, global South messaging where there aren't the same bands and RT India, RT Balkan popped up in 2022 and they too are extremely um, rapidly, they're rapidly growing and compete, out competing with us in, in areas that really matter. And I think that's reflective of some of the debate in these regions on support for Ukraine. On TikTok, there was pressure by Ukrainian Western officials to take Moscow's propaganda seriously. And TikTok did, it claimed, label 50 accounts as Russian states controlled media. But that labeling process does not appear to have been comprehensive. Um, and we did analysis of, of the platform and found 78 TikTok accounts, 47 of which were labeled by the platform that are likely tied, tied to Kremlin funded outfits, outlets. And as of this spring, those accounts had more than 14 million followers and it generated more than 319 million engagements. So think about that for a second on TikTok, the fastest growing platform, despite supposed efforts by the platform to label and make users aware that they are engaging with Russian state-sponsored propaganda, really it's an incomplete, it's an incomplete effort and it creates serious problems um, around elections, around maintaining support, sustaining support for Ukraine. One other sort of anecdote, Margarita Simonyan, the editor-in-chief of RT, had an unlabeled TikTok account. So think about that, the biggest mouthpiece of the Kremlin on TikTok, unlabeled. YouTube, again, RT Espanol, very creative in circumventing the, ban, um, the, circumventing the YouTube ban. It's again created sort of spin-off accounts on YouTube superimposed new logos over RTs and simply run the same content all, all through, you know, without detecting any sort of uh, YouTube ban or, or label that it's state-sponsored propaganda. And these new channels that have spun up in the Spanish language, they have more, they generated more than 38 million views. So, you know, this is not insignificant, this sort of engagement. On Google News and Google search results, Russia, so, I, I like the quote that Ambassador Cronin used, there are lies for profit and there are lies for power. So on Google, this really plays out. And on Bing too, where either RT and Sputnik itself or through for-profit um, mouthpieces or content launderers as we call them, frequently get their search results in the top, they get their links in the top three to five search results on topics that matter to the Kremlin like Ukraine. So this is a real problem. You have other state-sponsored new, affiliated news sites from Russia's allies like Iran, Syria, Venezuela, um, and these sort of for-profit enterprises that are simply trying to generate ad revenue and clickbait by repurposing, use, using generative AI, repurposing RT content, and getting tons of eyes in front of those links. Because if, if a user enters a search term, they're seeing links to, to big news, uh, the big news network, which is, you know, sort of this horrible content launder uh, based in the Middle East, or there's even a network of spoof U.S. local news sites that have emerged um, that probably are not connected to a Russian state-sponsored actor, but are simply using AI to repurpose RT stories. So it's really a, a complicated environment, um, and in the context of elections coming up, both in my country, but also in Europe, 
the European parliamentary elections and possibly in Ireland, the fact that these companies are still facilitating Russian propaganda reaching European, American, and even global audiences is a real problem that still needs to be addressed. Thank you, David. And thank you for sticking on time. So we see if we uh, have Martina back. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, uh, we hear you on the call, but not unfortunately in the room. Uh, I, I propose uh, we can try to fix the problem during the lunch break. Okay. Well, I can and also, I, 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 now that it's, I also have a little time to do my speech, so you can continue working in the background. <laughs> while I do that. And then we might also see if we get, get Martina back and her voice back by the Q&A time, then we'll give her, we'll give her priority during Q&A. Sorry about that, Martina. I was really enjoying your presentation. <laughs> All right. Um, so while, while we are trying to, to fix our technicalities in the background, um, I, I have the uh, honorous task of, well, <laughs> giving you a few of my own um, uh, bits and pieces of information, but also to, to maybe try and summarize some of the themes um, that have emerged um, in our panel. Um, and here I will also be drawing on uh, some of the research that uh, we do at Dublin City University as part of um, the um, Institute, uh, the work of the Institute for Future of Media, Democracy and Society. Uh, and in particular, um, also because we also host one of the EDMO hubs, um, the Irish hub in particular, um, as well as looking at what kind of narratives emerge uh, in the EU and which of them could be susceptible um, to, to Russian disinformation. Um, I also have a set of slides, so if you want to bring those up, I promise I will run through them very quickly. Yes, I have slides. <laughs> um, but I, I'll, I'll start while, while the slides come up, and you can go to the second slide uh, immediately because the first one is just the cover. So what we're dealing with um, in the Irish context, and I have the enviable position of being a Ukrainian researcher working and living in Ireland, having worked and lived in the United States, so trust me, I have seen a lot of Russian disinformation. Um, so in Ireland, we know that um, there was a peak in trust in news during the COVID-19 era, which was really heartening. But since uh, the pandemic uh, has rolled, uh, scaled down, uh, trust in news has fallen back. And now um, in the latest digital news report uh, published this year, we know that 47 of Irish respondents agree or, or strongly agree that they can trust most of the news, which is still pretty high, but it's not the highest in the EU. Uh, we also know that for um, an average Irish uh, news reader, their main sources of news are still television and um, online sources. Uh, however, for younger people, people in the 18 to 25 age group, social media remain the dominant source of news. And this is something that we should really, really be paying attention to. Um, Irish news consumers have also become more wary about discussing political events or issues online, and uh, they are uh, much more reluctant to do so than their counterparts in the US, um, UK, and Europe. So all of these things um, give us, next slide please, some, some context for how uh, we are trying to deal with um, disinformation, uh, including Russian disinformation. We also know that across the EU and in Ireland as well, there are growing worries about misinformation and disinformation. So for Irish uh, respondents, concern about what is real and what is fake on the internet is actually much higher than um, on average in the EU. It's 64% 60, people are really worried about misinformation uh, compared to 50% in the rest of Europe. And actually the Irish are much more like the US news consumers in that uh, they are much more worried about disinformation, although the UK beats them both. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the uh, disinformation uh, monitoring uh, work that the Digital Media Observatory has been doing in Ireland and across Europe has really focused on disinformation about Ukraine and the war in Ukraine uh, in the past uh, year. And we know that uh, over 2022, um, obviously at the start, there was a huge peak 
uh, in disinformation, and in particular Russian disinformation about the war in Ukraine. Uh, but it has since kind of died down, uh, although this doesn't mean that, you know, it isn't still very active. So usually the way EDMO tracks disinformation is it relies on a network of fact checkers, um, media organizations, nonprofit organizations um, around Europe uh, that contribute to producing uh, monthly monitoring reports. Um, and this is what we use as a basis for understanding which disinformation narratives are prevalent. Um, so we know that after skyrocket, uh, since the number of false news skyrocketed um, or that are related to Ukraine in February 2022, um, and we had record numbers of false news detected um, regarding war in Ukraine in March 2022, 59% of the total detect disinformation by the EGMO network related to news uh, about the war, false news about the war in Ukraine. And even now, they are, uh, they've abated somewhat, but they are still among the most violent, consistently present in European media. Um, although the percentage has decreased, it's really interesting that um, the topics uh, have kind of um, also changed slightly. Uh, next slide, please. So you'll see, uh, for instance, that uh, in November 2022, we had these very specific war-related um, disinformation narratives um, saying Russian invasion of Ukraine is justified uh, because, you know, Russian-speaking population in Donbass uh, was being targeted. Um, there's also a bit of pro-Ukraine war propaganda, but it's mostly like, you know, we have the ghost of Kiev. So it's, it's really not comparable at all with pro-Russian war propaganda, which exaggerates Russian military achievements, uh, labels Zelensky and everybody else uh, a Nazi or drug addict or what have you, um, and also involves Western traditional media, accusing them of spreading false news and false images about the war. So we also see this mirroring of disinformation and fact-checking language where, you know, Russian-sponsored uh, media and Russian-sponsored actors also engage in doing fact-checks, although their fact-checks, of course, have nothing to do with reality. Uh, there's also a lot of misinformation um, in the last year about um, staged massacres, false flag crisis actors, and this again plays into a very popular type of disinformation that is well known um, to Western researchers already. Uh, however, next slide, uh, by, um, by um, August this year, we see a slight change. A lot of the narratives that were war specific um, and that were really popular are not really as present. And what we see is a change towards um, targeting other topics. So what happens is uh, false news becomes more related to trending topics um, and starts to appeal to concerns uh, of Western audiences um, or populist narratives. So we see, for instance, disinformation about scapegoating refugees, including Ukrainian refugees, you know, um, appealing to economic concerns or anti-migrant uh, narratives and sentiments. We also see that uh, there is false news related to humanitarian aid to Ukraine, saying that, you know, humanitarian aid to Ukraine is dangerous. Uh, corruption in Ukraine is uh, uh, flowering and blooming, and we shouldn't help Ukraine. Again, we go back to the weapons being sold in the black market. Uh, there's also disinformation that isn't aimed at Ukraine, and that uh, talks about Russophobic sentiment in European countries, especially in the Baltic states, I'm sure they would agree, but they don't necessarily see it as a bad thing. But again, there's a lot of disinformation um, uh, basically playing up that sentiment. Uh, and again, uh, exaggerating the negative economic, social, and political consequences of the war in Russia, uh, in Russia, but also um, uh, consequences of the war and the sanctions in Europe. Uh, and again, the, we go back to the recurrent Nazi uh, narrative where they're also now saying that it's not just Ukraine that is full of Nazis, but Ukraine's allies are also pro-Nazi mm -hmm. and or they exploit Ukraine. And here we see recurrent stories about Poland wanting to conquer parts of Western Ukraine, U US buying up Ukrainian land, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that there is a change in, in uh, the kinds of trends and the kinds of narratives that we see. Next slide, please. Um, 
Research that uh, we also did as part of uh, a project called Mediatized DU, which is a Horizon 2020 funded project um, that I lead um, at DCU, shows that there is a number of EU and war related narratives in Irish media, which are not necessarily promoted, uh, all of them promoted by um, Russian supported actors or pro Russian disinformation actors, but many of these narratives create spaces for interventions by disinformation actors, right? So over um, the past year and a half, we've seen an increase in debates about um, EU support and member state support for Ukraine, solidarity, the discussions around sanctions, discussions about, for instance, Irish uh, political and military neutrality, which are, have become somewhat polarized. And although at first glance it might seem like um, these debates existed, for instance, in Irish society well before uh, the war. We now see that there are distinct connections being drawn sometimes by disinformation um, actors who are trying to, uh, again, um, create a more polarized environment and to, um, you know, increase uh, the kind of um, emotionality of these debates and also, you know, talk about like appealing to the sentiments that already exist um, in Irish societies and EU societies that are already perhaps concerned with um, remaining non-aligned or affiliating themselves with NATO, etc. So there's, there's lots of space in mainstream media and social media discourse for disinformation actors to intervene and they do so. And sometimes it's harder to detect, sometimes it's easier to detect, um, but uh, we know that they are trying, right? And we know that uh, very often we're not, as, as my colleagues have said, we're not talking about specifically overtly Russian sponsored or state funded disinformation operations, but we're also talking about specific individuals uh, who are promoting pro-Russian narratives in European uh, media and social media. And we're also sometimes talking about swarms of anonymous accounts that attempt to, um, to tackle particular speakers in the social media space or um, you know, uh, create um, and launch attacks on particular public figures who speak out in support of Ukraine. So there's lots of different tactics happening. Uh, next slide, and this will probably be my last slide. Um, just again to go back to what um, our wonderful introductory panel was talking about, um, we cannot underscore enough uh, the importance of um, identifying policy challenges and responding to them. So in Ireland, uh, the Commission for Media was established in March 2023, and it is now Ireland's new media regulator. Um, the DSA uh, is something the Commission has welcomed, and it sees uh, its key task uh, to minimize the effects of disinformation in Ireland and across Europe. It is, of course, a tall order, given that Ireland has already been a bit overwhelmed, given that it's been serving as uh, the data protection central for, for most social media platforms. Uh, but nonetheless, right, the work here is ongoing. Uh, and again, uh, the EU's Code of Practice on Disinformation and its uh, more strengthened, more recent version um, has a central role to play here. But because it's voluntary, right, it has limitations. Um, so um, we've uh, done research um, under the EDMO project of, uh, of the transparency reporting under this even strengthened code of practice. And we conclude that the data provided by the platforms, although it's there, it's simply not detailed enough to be useful to disinformation researchers and to policy analysts. They need to do more. So. It is again really important that we now have the Digital Services Act and the legal instruments within it, which is now uh, making companies, uh, platforms legally uh, obliged to provide and disclose more, dis more, in a tr more transparent information on how they're tackling disinformation uh, and how they take down accounts or how they do social media um, moderation. Uh, so the DSA will be a key conduit for, for um, enforcing platform responsibility. Ireland is also uh, very keenly aware of its important role, and so um, it is also working on a national counter disinformation strategy. Its development is in the early days, uh, but importantly, and here I'm referencing Martina's um, presentation again, um, the strategy takes stock of 
the existing disinformation uh, threats, tactics, and patterns, and it relies on cooperation with international partners to develop broad response principles that center human rights um, and privacy, um, but also are based on evidence and based on global and EU best practices. So here again, we see that collaborative learning and enforcement mechanisms are really, really important. Um, and this is something that must remain at the center um, of the work we do as researchers, as policy analysts, as government officials. Um, and I think, you know, if anything, we've seen that in this panel, there is evidence that this collaboration is already bearing fruit. So I'll stop my presentation there, and I would like to see if maybe by some chance we can get Martina back, but then also that so we have uh, time for questions and answers. Point, uh, but they are using like uh, different quotes. Also, of course, they use diplomatic means. Uh, they have a lot of uh, representatives there who knows local languages, which really they are good in it. We we that uh, don't uh, know what. Uh, like our our Minister of Foreign Affairs, as I remember, they are going to open eleven embassies there. So hopefully, we also will uh, be in, uh, there and to to speak with uh, the representatives in different countries of Africa. And uh, also, they use the same tactics and they have same tables as there, <laughs> uh, as uh, Kemi Seba, Natalie Yamp, uh, who are in RT France, uh, speaks the same narratives uh, which Russia wants to hear uh, and to disseminate everywhere. Thank you. So in terms, of, in terms of preparing for the coming waves of elections in the US, in the EU, um, in Ireland, elsewhere, what do you think should be the, the most important actions? Uh, what, what, sh what, it, what is it that we need to be focusing on? And I think keeping in mind in particular that uh, while you mentioned that platforms are responding in, in some way, um, the, the, you know, the Russian networked authoritarian uh, state is also really good at circumventing uh, the, the things that platforms are already doing. They understand the logics and they kind of try to, to play along with them. So what is it that we should be focusing on in order to safeguard democratic elections? Well, I think we need to focus on the fact that this type of activity is still happening. In, in the United States, we've become so consumed with our own domestic political turmoil that we've largely ignored the fact that there are still foreign actors, namely Russia, that have every incentive to try to influence how Americans think and, and on any number of electoral issues, but especially on the war in Ukraine, because it's such a, a political issue now in the States and it's so important, it's existential to the Kremlin. Uh, but the same is true in Europe, and, and I think Europeans are more savvy about this than we are, and, and, and because it's it's closer to to Europe than it is to us. But I, I think, you know, Tanya, you asked like, what should we be doing? I honestly think the pre-bunking method that the Biden administration used in the run-up to Ukraine is an excellent precedent, and I think. Government actors, I think civil society needs to be extremely vigilant in getting information, good, accurate information out to the public well ahead of election day, because the closer you get to election day, the more politicized that sort of intelligence sharing and information sharing is. But like, this is our jobs now. We have to get this information out there and expose how these tactics are being used against us in the months leading up to a particular election. And it's happening. We have all this data that we're seeing and hearing about. It's clearly happening. So that, I think, is, is the strategy that we need to adopt. Thank you very much. I think that makes a lot of sense because also from what Martina said earlier, you know, like by now, we kind of have a very good idea of the predictability of some of and the recurrence of some of these narratives. So this actually allows us to start thinking and be thinking about what kind of information needs to be released ahead of time. And, you know, this is something that, as you say, some, some countries have already successfully tried. How are we doing on getting Martina back? No, unfortunately. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully for those of you on the call, uh, if you do have questions for Martina, you might also be able to ask them in the chat. Um, and she might be able to respond to them. I know she really wanted to also talk about the responses to the, the threats, tactics, um, and patterns, uh, but hopefully 
we will have more opportunity to hear from her. Now, we have uh, a few minutes, uh, so we have a microphone also, right, for the audience. So I'm happy to open the floor to questions. If you raise your hand, our wonderful uh, staff will be there to provide you with the microphone. And if you could also introduce yourself. I can also, get, well, I, I don't want to deprive people of, <laughs> of their job. Uh, I'm Larissa Mikulets, Ambassador of the Republic of Moldova. Actually, I do not have a question. I just want to thank organizers for this important event. Um, definitely, Russian propaganda and disinformation is uh, a worldwide, international concern. But it's a very high concern for countries in the region, including uh, my country, the Republic of Moldova. We are also uh, a high target for uh, Russian uh, disinformation and, and propaganda, especially because of our European uh, aspirations. And uh, we felt it uh, during a long period, but especially last for last two years and just recently having uh, local uh, elections, uh, so on, so on. That's why uh, uh, my country, leadership of the country, uh, decided that we also need to set up a center similar like this one that uh, 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 we were uh, informed in Ukraine. Uh, our center is called Center for, for Strategic, uh, inform, uh, Strategic Com Communication and Countering uh, Disinformation. Uh, there is also a, a great lady like you, director of, of this center, uh, because tactics, uh, instruments, uh, especially in the region, they have I uh, know and I assume they are very similar. I call, uh, I ask you, and I hope that they will be a great cooperation between uh, these centers. And I really ask you to give a hand of support to newly formed center uh, in Moldova because uh, together we can achieve uh, better results. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I want to say thank you to European uh, Union, to um, uh, United States, uh, because they are supporting during last this year essentially our efforts to countering that massive disinformation that's, that comes uh, uh, in, in my country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I, I agree this is absolutely um, a spot on comment because on the one hand, you know, we can celebrate um, the recent events and the progress that Ukraine and Moldova are making in terms of their EU accession. On the other hand, we've seen that cooperation is central and really key, especially to smaller states, uh, which, you know, don't often have uh, the same resources that, you know, a country like the U.S. or the EU might have. So learning from each other, uh, establishing cooperations, developing that common vocabulary for disinformation tracking is really, really important. And I think here those existing EU initiatives that Martina touched on and Anaïd touched on will be very, very important. So Anaïd, I think you have a coffee date in Moldova in your, your ne nearest future. Please. Good morning, Tom McEnany of Effective oh. Aid Ukraine. Um, I, my question is aimed in particular at Annie, but perhaps David might like to chime, chime in. On a, a trip to Ukraine earlier this month, I was amazed and somewhat confused to see so many Ukrainians walking around with large white geese. I mean, the, the life-size cuddly toy as opposed to the, the live variety. And it took me a while to figure out that this was the Ukrainian people's response to the Russian government assertion several months earlier that Ukraine and the United States were conspiring to weaponize geese in order to target Russia and the Russian people. And my question is, given how effective Ukraine and Ukrainian people has been at using humor to engage with audiences to debunk Russian disinformation, is there more that we in countries outside Ukraine that support Ukraine should be doing or could be doing, particularly in Ireland where in a good day we like to think we have a decent sense of humour, could be doing to use humour to engage with, in particular, social media audiences to tackle this information? Thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, the uh, sense of humour sometimes really saves us to, uh, from the you know, depressive uh, situation which uh, we, we exist in. Uh, but um, I just uh, need to mention, of course, not just Europe or US are tired of uh, constantly uh, 
depressive information which comes from our country, uh, but our people too. That's why we are using, uh, why I mentioned that we even have account in TikTok. We understood that uh, we need to use some humor uh, just to, you know, to pay attention to from uh, for our people just that we are in war, that our soldiers, like some videos are our soldiers dancing, or I don't know, we make some videos with the face uh, Putin with, who uh, dance uh, also, N not, <laughs> good, uh, in not good way, but still, uh, well, we make jokes because we understand that uh, we need to pay attention for, uh, to our people and our uh, young uh, aud uh, audition that that uh, what is actually happening and not to forget about it and maybe you saw some videos from our um, ministry of defense with the thank you videos to us to united kingdom uh to france like uh, je t'aime etc like <laughs> these videos were also was created uh by our people uh not from our center but from the stratcom of a uh, ministry of defense just also to pay attention to our uh partners that we are grateful but in the uh, humor way too because uh well, seriously, if, if the President Zelensky comes to Parliament and gives serious speech, we give the content which could, you know, pay attention to uh, other people. And of course, memes and humor will help uh, in future to pay attention to these points that, uh, unfortunately, some people tired with. That's why, yes, it's uh, definitely the tool from our side, the, from the truth side. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Anait. Yes, humor is definitely not just a coping mechanism for Ukrainians, but it's, it's also a strategic weapon. Um, and, and I think we've, we are already seeing some research on, on uh, early research on the power of memes, uh, NAFO, and all of the other specifically Ukrainian humor. And I have, to, I have to give it to Ukrainians, just even like trying to translate Ukrainian language jokes for the foreign audience is, is one hell of a task, but I think we're managing. <laughs> Um, what I would like to do now is, uh, because we are, we are still in a hybrid event, and Martina actually had a few more comments um, to the question about elections, so I'm just going to read out uh, her comments and just pretend like you're seeing Martina and hearing her voice. To contribute to questions about elections, what is really crucial now is raising awareness about Russia's different tactics in the information space to fuel distrust towards the democratic process. Examples include promoting one particular political view. We saw this in EU elections in 2019, also the French elections in 2017. And typically these are really extreme views, often far right, without giving space to other political perspectives um, in its outlets that are known to be peddling um, manipulation and disinformation. Um, focus on questioning the entire democratic process and institutions we also saw this in the EU elections in 2019, in a limited manner also in the recent Polish elections. Uh, the other tactic is also polluting the information space with contradictory narratives to spread confusion. This was very much evident in the case of the Brexit referendum in 2016 and the German elections in 2017. For example, on Twitter, uh, anonymous bots were amplifying both pro and anti-Brexit voices as well as pro-Merkel and anti-Merkel narratives in Germany in the context of her migration policy. So the goal here is to discourage people from voting and undermining their trust in the democratic process and making conscious fact-based decisions as citizens. So we thank Martina for that intervention. Um, I think we have, uh, we are going to maybe attempt to take one question from the virtual audience. Um, so um, there is, uh, a question, so I don't know if we can technically do that. So can, we, yeah, if can, you have a question and want to put it in the chat, Mikal, please do so. We can't give you a voice, but uh, type your question. And meanwhile, David. Will... Yeah, just very briefly to, to follow on to Martina's comments. It's also very important for us to attribute some of those narratives to overt attributable Russian state-sponsored actors. When RTs puts out something, when a Russian diplomatic, an embassy account, or an MFA spokeswoman says something publicly, that's attributable, that's not bots and trolls. And so much of the disinformation that is being ingested by Western audiences is coming from attributable overt Russian state-sponsored state sources. Like That is important for us to highlight to our publics, our citizens, um, this isn't some you know, covert gray army bot and troll thing exclusively. Yes, that happens too. But I think the more we could 
transparently show and point to the Kremlin and their spot. Like that is extremely important for us to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this again speaks to um, uh, one of the things we were uh, seeing on Martina's slides, which is you know the fact that the use of official diplomatic channels to spread disinformation narratives is actually a well-known tactic. And in fact, they rely on um, the, the reach of these channels and sometimes the prestige or the authority of these channels to actually make it sound plausible. But um, also, right, there's, there's no, uh, no shame in actually calling it out and, and showing it for what it is, which is false, uh, false information. Um, so um, we have a, just a few more minutes, so they, there don't seem to be any forthcoming questions in the chat. So if there is another question in the room, perhaps, otherwise, I think um, then it, it is my pleasure. I think we've managed to talk about so many things in such a short time. Um, and I think uh, all credit goes to our wonderful uh, speakers and presenters, Anait, Martina, David, uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you after lunch for our next panel, where we'll actually be talking about how do we how do we deal with all this? How do we address this? What are some of the responses? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Unfortunately, I did not learn how to say good afternoon in Irish <laughs> yet. But we are about to start again. So I would like to invite you to uh, take a seat. Uh, and thank you very much for staying with us uh, for the second panel, which is going to be extremely interesting. And hopefully, Vlad and Roman uh, managed to ensure that um, we are heard and we can hear our amazing speakers who are joining us online, one from Helsinki and one from Washington, D.C. So, Vlad, if you can uh, change the slide to the panel two. Yes, almost. Wonderful. So I would like to officially open the second panel of our today's symposium and invite Susan Daly as a moderator to lead this important and very practical discussion on how we can actually fight Russian propaganda. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, and uh, I realized I, I have two jackets. I just decided to wear the same one today, in case you would uh, mistake me. Um, so good afternoon. I'm Susan Daly, and I hope you had a chance to grab some lunch and refuel there, because this is obviously quite a, a meaty subject, and there's no way we covered it all today, but I think the first panel was incredible. Uh, Tanya did such a great job bringing it together to set out, um, I suppose, the scale of the problem and the, the, the many ways in which we're seeing Russian propaganda and disinformation impacting not just Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is almost the funnel through which the rest of us have woken up and been able to talk about it. Um, so our panel is uh, entitled Practical Cases and Best Practices Encountering Russian Disinformation Worldwide. So um, that sounds quite hopeful. I, I think best practices is uh, promising maybe a lot, but, but perhaps not a full solution uh, because it's, it's too large a problem for that. But, um, you know, before I, I introduce our esteemed panel of experts, and I do hope the online works because otherwise these two guys are going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting and we'll be expecting a lot of questions from the audience. Um, but I think this has been a very important event and I really want to thank the Embassy of Ukraine to Ireland, the Ukrainian Action in Ireland group, um, and the European Commission representation and the US Embassy in Ireland for bringing it all together because that shows a lot of networking and partnership. And I think that's going to be a big part of what we're talking about here in terms of an approach uh, and a, counter, a countermeasure that's going to be really important. Um, I've been asked to just give a little context on why I'm here and my role and, and because it gives a little bit of context to misinformation, disinformation in Ireland as we've seen it in the last uh, eight years or so. Um, my day-to-day -day role is managing editor of journal media 
Now, we have been around for only 13 years, but we um, are the publisher of the largest native online news organisation in Ireland, news publication, The Journal. Some people are probably aware of it. Uh, we have a sports writing site and we also have an investigative platform called noteworthy.ie. Um, but we also have a unit called The Journal Fact Check. When I started that in 2016, um, I'll be honest, I'd come back from maternity leave facing into a general election. I had very little patience or sleep. Um, so I was like, no, we're going to fact check all these policy statements and promises coming in from politicians. And then we'll be ready for the live debates too, where we can roll out and go, well, we've checked that number and that's not quite correct. So it was very popular with people. Um, it's not a new approach. Fact checking at the time was quite big in the States in particular, but it wasn't really... I suppose, outside of the regular journalistic practice of, of fact-checking your work, um, kind of stating we're doing it this way. So after that was finished, we actually kept it on. Um, we joined the International Fact-Checking Network, which is based out of Pointer in the US, um, you know, subscribed to their code of principles, got up to speed, got workshops, got training, and we rolled it out actually to our newsroom um, because we're quite a small uh, unit. And at the time... We were scaling it up and down depending on the level of need that we saw in the public to have better information or information corrected because it was impacting some serious decisions they were making. So we found things like um, two fairly contentious referendums we had, one on marriage equality and one on abortion legislation, of course, 2015, 2018, that we became very, very busy indeed in the fact check unit. Um, we also found that, you know... <sighs> misinformation and disinformation were very much focused on Irish matters, so things that people living in Ireland felt were impacting them. That has changed. Uh, we don't scale down anymore. We are always on. Um, we're still quite small, and this is where I'm going to, I suppose, say that working and knowing what other organisations in other states um, and larger organisations like the Global Engagement Centre in the US, what they're doing because we're actually all on the same page here. We're all trying to tackle things that are very unique in our own markets, but there are common narratives and common strategies that we try and employ um, and tailor to our own places. Um, so we are now, we're part of the Ireland Edmo Hub that Tanya mentioned with DCU's Fujo Institute, among others. Um, I was in Croatia as part of that, meeting other fact checkers in September, and it was really interesting to see the things that are popping up ahead of elections. We were looking at some elections that have already happened and trying to get a little bit of a, a kind of a, I suppose, ahead of 2024 US elections, EU elections for us, uh, local elections in Ireland. And things are very different depending on where you're coming from. But we started to see some common narratives. Um, one that you might find interesting was a colleague in the Sedmo Hub, which is based in the Czech Republic. He was saying that they, they found that people who wanted to vote there or people who were interested in voting, 50% of them, though, took as read that there was going to be foreign interference in their elections. Now, I'm not saying that's true, but that's their perception. Okay, you can kind of get on board with that. You can see why they might think that. But when they, dial, they dug down into it and they were like, well, where's the, where do you think the interference is coming from? I mean, if I was to ask the room, but like put up your hands who you think they were going to say first, you might be wrong, depending on how you feel about it. The, the majority of those 50% thought the interference was going to come from the EU. And the second interferer, the US. Russia was down here. So that's really interesting. Where is that perception coming from? So that's what I mean by the more you, you talk to, to other people, you, you learn how things are different in their market. Um, so we have also found that the domestic-focused topics, that has broadened, particularly since the pandemic, where obviously global narratives were coming across to us. But we have found that pandemic, while the misinformation, disinfo about that and vaccines and so on, has ebbed, obviously, uh, it's the nature of those things in terms of emergency. Um, we find that Irish, the Irish public is, is reacting, responding and reading things on a more global nature, more cross-border nature than they ever did before. And so we have found ourselves fact-checking things that are being seen elsewhere and trying to figure out how did this get to Ireland. We're an Anglophone country, so obviously we're influenced by uh, information coming in from the States and the UK. But as referenced earlier on, great example about that hoax letter that was supposed to come from the Department of Justice in Ireland that was saying that um, 
Ukrainian people who had been conscripted um, and were living in Ireland, obviously shirking their responsibilities, was obviously the subtext of this, were going to be extradited by the Irish government. Because we were in a newsroom, uh, we were very easily contacted, able to contact the Department of Justice who, who told us and gave us quotes and said, absolutely not. Um, we even went through the letter and said, look, these are the red flags, this is the language used, this is the wrong thing, this is that. This is how to know this if it comes out at you in another format. Um, and we talked to legal uh, experts as well who just said, even hypothetically, this can't happen because in Ireland's legislation, we just don't have the cap cap capability to extradite someone on a charge of something that doesn't exist in our own legal framework, so conscription. So all of these things were brought together, but we were working with AFP in France on this because they saw the, somebody had translated into French and it was going around there as well. And honestly, we we fact checked quite a bit about the Ukrainian war. Um, it had been very much on the ground, you know, what people believed was happening in Ukraine. But this made us sit up and go, whoa, this doesn't come from any of the bad actors that we recognize. Now we know it's come from Nigeria. That's made a little link for me, which we didn't know. Um, so we've suddenly realized that Ireland is a target because possibly we have a lot of people here, um, you know, seeking safety from, from within Irish borders. So that was a bit of a wake up call, but it does show how we are all networked now. And it's a global issue. And the more we work together, the, the easier. I mean, look, all, I mean, I'm speaking as, as fact checker, but also as journalists and editors, um, we want our work to be useful and impactful. Um, and that one side of it is fact-checking and acting as a corrective. But the other thing is the role of independent quality journalism, um, which I know will be mentioned by some of our panellists as one of the pillars in countering disinformation, is, is to, to try and promote the quality information that people are trying to put out there um, to inform the public, sort of acting as a counter to the, the bad stuff, if, if I'm to put it that way. Um, but we do find ourselves better equipped to at least face the threat because of the network of like-minded individuals and organisations. Other fact-checkers, academics, policymakers, um, we're all sharing information, strategies, ideas, but also our failures and our frustrations. I think that's a really important place to be as well. I just returned from a two-week programme in the States, uh, part of the International um, Visiting Leaders uh, Programme, organised by the US State Department, and I was one of 18 journalists from Europe, and we were all from different countries. Um, and there was so much value in looking at media responsibility around disinformation and how people are trying to do that in the States in their own way, policymakers, academics, local media trying to, I suppose, tackle news deserts in what's a rather large area. I mean, if you try to put Ireland into America, you can, you can imagine what that looks like on a map. Uh, all of us kind of stakeholders in trying to tackle this problem and how to cut through the noise because people are getting lots of information that's kind of the problem um, where they're getting it from and helping them to understand the source of it is something that we are trying to figure out now i wish i could say i came back off the plane uh, from minneapolis with a solution but i have not um and i know the panelists here will say there's no silver bullet either but there are strategies um and they're going to be generous enough to share them with us today so I have a particular order, which is going to be a great surprise to the people who are joining us online because we just decided uh, at lunchtime. Um, but I think after watching the other panel, we're going to start with um, Olesha um, because Olesha is head of communications and co-founder of the Analytical Center, Ukrainian Security and Cooperation Center. Um, and her work, and when we spoke about this uh, last week, she has a lot of examples of how this is happening and the impacts. And I think it's a great scene setter for us to, um, it's a great compliment to the first panel for us to kind of understand. Um, and then we'll, we'll have uh, contributions from our other panelists who are kind of working on dealing with the consequences of that and trying to tailor it for specific places, incidents, campaigns, and so on. So. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Susan. Uh, and thank you for uh, organizing the event to the embassy, a Ukrainian and both uh, American embassies, and to uh, the Ukrainian action and uh, Anna did, and her team did a great job organizing the event. Uh, so my name is Olesia, and uh, yeah, I'm a head of communications of Ukrainian uh, 
think tank, but also, yeah, we, we, provide, we are providing uh, not only analytics, but also campaigns to do something about the things that we are analyzing. So, uh, yeah, I would like to start, start with a, a famous Russian saying that, uh, that uh, is saying Russia cannot be understood with the mind alone. And I think that maybe lots of, of people here and people listening to us uh, online heard that phrase. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the last two years and uh, full-scale invasion showed us that this saying is true, really true, in the most uh, horrific way. Uh, but also, uh, Russia acts in specific ways. And that could be monitored, and uh, that could be followed. And that is kind of predictable. Uh, so our team at Ukrainian Security Cooperation Center dedicated almost 10 years uh, to uh, researching Russian hybrid warfare and Russian hybrid influence. Uh, we started to follow Russian influence inside Ukraine because Ukraine, uh, of course, was affected the uh, most, maybe, uh, in the world because of the, the duration of occupation of different forms of our country by Russia. Uh, but uh, with the beginning of full-scale invasion, we are trying to uh, widen our exper experience and expertise to the entire world because we see that Russia, as it uh, cannot gain any huge victories on the front line, on the, on the field in Ukraine, it's starting to affect other countries, other societies, trying to gain the victory in any way possible. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Russian uh, aims, I guess, are not uh, secret to anybody uh, present here. Uh, it's been uh, mainly three things uh, that Russia is uh, following for the decades and centuries. Uh, so Russia's aims uh, remains the same for a long time. It is uh, presence in every region uh, of the world, meaning widening its empire. Uh, making Western democracies weak and chaotic uh, because uh, the, the, the fight and the war against Western societies is the same existential war as Russia conducts with Ukraine. So the West is the, the, uh, the, big, big, uh, the biggest threat uh, to, the, uh, to Russia. And, of course, enrichment natural resources to steal and to sell to other countries. Uh, and to achieve these goals, Russia uses standard tools. It is political, economical, informational, uh, humanitarian, and uh, cyber. Uh, so I would like to quickly start on, on this. Uh, we call it the, the fronts of the hybrid warfare that Russia is conducting. Uh, what about political, uh, political front, political uh, instruments? Uh, they are regarding... Uh, the corruption of the politicians that can uh, help Russia to gain its goals on the international level. Uh, this is uh, also can be related to not only to the people and politicians that are uh, acting in inside their countries, but also politicians that are, uh, for example. Uh, working to, um, to legitimize the illegal occupation of temporary occupied territories by Russia because those exact politicians are coming to uh, Ukrainian temporary occupied territories and acting like uh, so-called uh, observers. Thank you. Yeah, uh, they're acting like so-called observers, but the fact is they are legitimizing their occupation. Uh, economic front is known uh, as well to everybody. Uh, it, is, um, it is about, well, uh, 
making states dependent on Russian uh, natural resources and establishing ties to the Russian companies uh, in other states. Uh, this is regarding uh, Luke Oil or Ross Adam, etc. Uh, the humanitarian and the least uh, obvious of all of them, and we hear for the last two years, we hear many, uh, many things in contrary to that, uh, to the, to that fact. Uh, Russia is, using, is known for using its culture uh, to, uh, well, okay, to be great and to be exceptional because this is how the Russians are presenting their culture. Uh, and after that, uh, the, the, the huge and exceptional Russian, uh, Russian culture stands in the way of adequate recognition of the actions of Russians. Like those who wrote the war and the peace could not go to Ukrainian cities, violently kill women, children, and steal toilets, right? Uh, and in, uh, informational, of course, the one that we are talking today, this is uh, creating the parallel reality. So Russians are using one of the uh, methods is to make uh, truth in the middle when you are, uh, when the fact is here and you are making the false fact that stays here, people are tend to find the, the truth in the middle, but not where, where the, the original fact was. Uh, so yeah, with the beginning of a full scale invasion, when the world saw the essence of Russia and the essence of Russian Ukrainian war, as an existential war between evil and, and good, uh, it became problematic for Russia to use its network directly. Uh, so uh, if earlier we heard direct pro-Russian rhetoric, today such words from the mouth of public opinion leaders could directly affect their ratings and their popularity. Uh, therefore, Russia continues to work in more covert operations using the pain points of states to achieve what it wants. Uh, one of the most important points of concentrations of uh, Russia's effort is working for the collapse of the Western coalition around Ukraine. Uh, and uh, one of the tools for this, Russia uses the method of discrediting Ukrainian refugees abroad. Uh, we've been talking about this topic uh, earlier today, but uh, my the, the the case that I would like to present today is it is regarding the topic of Ukrainian refugees and using them to trying to undermine um, uh, Ukrainian status uh, in Western societies in Czech Republic, uh, pr precisely in Czech Republic, and to try to destabilize the situation inside the country itself. So on June 10th, uh, this year, 2023, a case involving a death of a Roma individual uh, with a Ukrainian national was reported in the Czech Republic. The Czech, uh, Czech publication Romia, uh, citing the police, reports that the altercation uh, leading to injuries and death began on public transportation. Uh, so some witnesses claim that it was a self-defense, some not. But uh, anyways, this case is been, uh, has been um, at, the, at the police hands since then, and they are uh, working on uh, make the justice in the case itself. But the case is just one part of the huge campaign that Russia conducts. Um, well, from the analysis, uh, analysis of uh, news during June, July, uh, 2023, reporting on the conflict between Ukrainians and Czech Roma, it is apparently that there were at least seven further accusations against Ukrainian refugees for crimes against Roma. However, the Czech police only confirmed two cases out of, of that seven. Uh, the other five was totally false, totally untrue, totally made up. One of the cases uh, was regarding the, the Roma woman uh, that uh, posted online about Ukrainian refugees uh, assaulting her and uh, even threatening to kill all Roma. 
in the Czech Republic. Uh, this woman uh, gained a seven month of suspended sentence with one year probation for false accusations and spreading hatred just recently from the Czech, uh, Czech Republic's police. Uh, immediately after the first report on the situation, direct accusation, uh, accusations of Ukrainians uh, of aggression against Roma began to appear on social media. They also criticized the stay of Ukrainians in the Czech Republic and the government of Petra Fiala, which allows Ukrainians refugees to uh, be in the country. Immediately after the first report on the situation, uh, sorry, <laughs> at least eight protests and rallies uh, took place in Czech Republic after that. Uh, they were uh, mostly uh, from Roma, Czech Roma activists, Czech Roma's uh, minority uh, inside the country. Uh, and um, it was used also by pro-Russian politicians and Russian, even, even Russian citizens to try uh, to, uh, to make the protests uh, inside the country uh, that came from the Czech Roma more violent and more ang angry. Uh, two, uh, big, yeah, the, the peak of discontent resulted in, other, uh, in open threats. Uh, so uh, on July 18, during protests in the Czech cities, Brno and Krupka, uh, shouts almost escalated into <laughs> pogroms of Ukrainian uh, refugee housing. So protesters uh, were shouting, Ukraine, go away, get out, you bastards. Uh, Damn Ukrainians, glory to Putin, and we are here at home. This is all quotes from the Czech trauma that were on the rallies, uh, even be besides the housing of uh, Ukrainian refugees in, in the Czech Republic. Um, to resolve the situation, the Czech Minister of Interior Affairs had to publicly defend Ukrainian refugees and refute anti-Ukrainian disinformation. Uh, it was really a good case of great reaction from the uh, state government in Czech Republic and also Ukrainian community there with the leading, uh, with the leaders of uh, Czech Roma uh, as well, came together and organized a couple of rallies uh, in Prague just to show united uh, nature and uniting nature of, uh, of, of both of minorities in th inside the country. So uh, this case was, uh, we were able to, to do something with it, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, on the other hand, why are we talking about Russians that uh, has to do anything with that case and with that matter. Because uh, Russian uh, state media, as well as Russian uh, telegram channels and other media resources uh, widely spread the information on that false accusations, all five of them that I pointed out before. Uh, they're all accusations regarding Ukrainian refugees attacking, uh, attacking Czech drama but yeah, they were referring to Roma as uh, gypsies in the, in the state media. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it was really, really hugely, uh, hugely covered by Russian media. Uh, and also uh, pro-Russian citizens and politicians, and sometimes Russians themselves, took uh, place in the rallies, in the actions that took place in the Czech Republic as well. So, yeah, the main tool of Russian propaganda for Roma is uh, used in the Czech Republic uh, was the demonization of Ukrainian refugees in Europe. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this, uh, th this was intended to reinforce already circulated um, disinformation that the Kremlin is spread into the countries of the free world looking for the pain points in every country that would be other, other spots you can push on and get the reaction, get to destabilize the situation inside the country, get to uh, point fingers to Ukrainian refugees, uh, to Ukrainian nationals, uh, 
in general, etc., and to polarize societies, of course. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Russia uh, as well, not a secret, but Russia often uses the most socially vulnerable and uh, or persecuted segments of society to destabilize the situation. In that case, it was Czech Roma uh, that uh, had their own ambitions inside Czech Republic and that who were not happy with the situation. Uh, so the main thesis used against uh, Ukrainian refugees were heard by them. Uh, the, the, the main thesis are uh, the same uh, in every, I guess, country where it is used by Russia. Refugees from Ukraine are unwelcomed in Europe. Ukrainians pose a threat to host countries. Ukrainians receive far better conditions than refugees from other countries. This one was particularly good for uh, Czech Roma in the Czech Republic. And uh, two more, Russia takes better care of refugees, like hell, and Ukraine inflicts harm and abuses civilians. Uh, this is like main thesis, main thesis uh, used, uh, <laughs> It's like a, a boxing game. Uh, main thesis used um, around the topic of Ukrainian refugees to try and to, to to try to undermine the the status of, of them in the Euro European countries, but this is uh, of course only one topic used by Russia, uh, and only one case uh, that were uh, that was uh, used by Russia in only one particular country. Unfortunately, we're talking about a much bigger picture now. Uh, so full-scale invasion, uh, as, I, as, as I have pointed before, full-scale invasion made uh, the Russian campaigns even more hidden, even more covered than before. But uh, the scale that they are producing it into got really, really bigger uh, since, since the, the beginning of the full-scale invasion. So we are talking about not only informational campaigns, we're talking about Russian influence in the countries, not the Western even, but the Western countries, the global south, which Russia uses as well to gain some political points in the international organizations, etc., and to uh, organize such brilliant uh, informational operations like my colleague Anaid told us before. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is a huge complex uh, issue the world needs to act uh, to, to battle. Uh, so uh, yeah, what can we do and what our organization is doing uh, and is uh, trying to do with our international partners worldwide? Uh, try and find, uh, we are trying and finding the Russian networks of influence. It could be a huge range, a wide range of people, politicians, uh, like just public opinion leaders, journalists, bloggers, uh, literally everybody that has the, vo the voice to say anything to, uh, to even a small group of people. Follow Russian money, uh, sanctions and Dealing with sanctions is also the huge problem and huge, um, huge case that we need to address as well regarding this because uh, not uh, leading the, the sanctions and not following of, um, not, controlling, not controlling the sanctions against Russia leads us to the moment when Russia has a uh, big resources to conduct the campaigns it is conducting right now in Ireland, in Czech Republic, in Ukraine, in other, other countries. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, okay, I, I, I just, yeah, 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 I'm trying to, to be very, very quick. Um, uh, yeah, Russian companies and uh, Russian businesses outside Russia that are still conducting its, its duties, 
uh, as uh, we saw the recent example in Bulgaria. Uh, and yeah, many, many, many other stuff regarding the networks of influence made by Russia by decades that we need to act against right now. Also, what, what can we do? We can show societies in detail how it works and to make it as accessible as, uh, and a, a, as broad as possible. And that is why I'm really glad of being here and that we are doing that uh, by, by uh, just talking about the practical cases and so on. Uh, and yeah, the, the last but not the least to uh, form policies. Uh, in the states that will help to avoid foreign interference in the future because we can see that other states use Russia as an example, as a, as a bad one. Uh, recently, uh, just recently, uh, I don't know, a recent week, I guess, a uh, Chinese campaign involving bot farms to discredit a, a group of politicians who spoke out against the China was exposed in Canada. Uh, so, yeah, Russia will be stopped only where and when it will be stopped by others. Let's do that. Thank you, Alessia. I'm going to move this for to us when you're after the, the next speaker. I think people online might be breaking up a little bit. Is that OK? Um, thank you so much for that. And I, I did promise she would lay it out very strongly for us, and she has indeed. We're going to go to Jakob Kalensky online. Um, you can see there, Jakob is the Deputy Director of the European Centre of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats. Great, there he is. Um, and uh, he and his colleagues founded, in, in, a, in a different uh, life, so to speak, the EU versus Disinfo campaign that has been mentioned earlier today. I think there might be some interest in that later if we have questions. Um, but certainly Jacob is working at a strategic level and advises quite a bit on countermeasure, uh, countermeasures against disinformation and how, you know, they might be tailored depending on where you're from. So he's, he's got quite a high level um, information uh, uh, skill set. So I'm going to, if Jacob is there, I'm going to hand it over to Jacob for your presentation. Um, is that okay? Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh... Can I get a sign if yes or not? Because I, I can't hear anything. <laughs> yes, we can hear you very well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, truly sorry I can't be there uh, with you. I actually have even a, a little bit of a special connection to Dublin. My first unsuccessful uh, PhD was, was concerning James Joyce and his novel Ulysses. So sorry I can't be there with you. Um, I would like to talk about uh, countering disinformation rather than rather than documentation of the disinformation. It is it is uh, something I have been focusing on ever since I left the uh, European Union, the the EU versus disinfo unit. It is my file also here in the Center of Excellence uh, for Countering Hybrid Threats in Helsinki. We work uh, very much with the practitioners in our participating states, uh, such as uh, Thomas Chabonis. Uh, hi, Thomas. Good to see you there. Uh, I also work a lot with the uh, Ukrainian professionals, both in the government and in the civil society. Uh, I have been coming to Ukraine to learn how to fight uh, Russian disinformation uh, ever since I started working in this in this business. Uh, just now, I am finishing a report on the Ukrainian lessons in countering disinformation, hopefully to be published uh, very early next year. Uh, so I'm truly happy to participate in uh, an event organized by the uh, Ukrainian colleagues uh, as well. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I will be talking about a model that I call four lines of defense uh, against disinformation. Uh, after several years of collecting the various countermeasures, as I saw them in the various places on this planet, mainly in the Euro-Atlantic space, uh, but also a few in, in Asia, uh, it appeared to me that there are four bigger groups of countermeasures that can be undertaken to fight back against the various uh, information aggressors. And, and this is supposed to be a toolbox showing all the various possible tools, uh, regardless of the differences between the countries. Because in some countries, it will be the government institutions leading in this fight. Uh, in other countries, it will be rather the civil society. That was uh, certainly the case of Ukraine in the post-Euromaidan period. 
um, in some countries uh, where the civil society, um, where the government is rather rather helping the disinformers, it is actually the civil society the only one that can that can step step in. But in other countries, the civil society is not as strong or not as capable, and the work is being done uh, by the governments. Um, and also, the, the main idea behind this four lines concept is uh, that there is. Uh, no silver bullet solution, as Susan, uh, Susan mentioned. Uh, you cannot hope that, for example, uh, media literacy solves the whole problem, or that strategic communication solves the whole problem. Uh, that is that is not the case. You, you need to apply many various countermeasures simultaneously uh, if you want to have a chance to to succeed. So the four lines are are as follows. Uh, first, it's documentation of the threat, situational awareness, detection. Uh, Second, it's about raising awareness of the threat. Uh, third, it is about repairing the weaknesses in the information ecosystems. And finally, the fourth is about limiting, punishing and deterring of the information aggressors. And I will be talking about each of the lines. Um, I will try to be brief and we can obviously elaborate on any, any of that in the Q&A &A session. So in the documentation part, uh, we need to be trying to find answers to the questions like how many disinformation channels are there? How many messages do they spread? How many people do they reach? Who are the people who are helping the Russian disinformation to spread further? Investigations similar to the ones that uh, Olesia was just, was just mentioning in her presentation. Another thing that needs to be documented is how many people do the disinformers actually persuade in, in various countries? Uh, in other words, the success or the impact of, of disinformation operations or, or the information aggression. And once you start documenting this, there are some very, very surprising numbers that can be found. Um, it is, I find it still very troubling that we do not have answers to, to these questions, like how many channels are there or how many people do they manage to persuade? Imagine we would be fighting the COVID pandemic without having the slightest idea how many people got the virus, uh, how many people ended up in a hospital, how many people are vaccinated, how many people died. It would be an impossible task. But we are in the situation when it comes to countering disinformation. We do not have these numbers, and yet we are supposed to somehow fight this problem. Um, another thing that needs a better documentation is how much money is being spent on spreading disinformation and also on countering disinformation as well. Um, so according to various estimates, Russia is spending something between 1.5 to 2 billion US dollars on, on their disinformation operations annually. Uh, according to, to other estimates, the number is even growing uh, ever, ever since the uh, full-scale invasion last, last February. Just for your comparison, the already mentioned EU versus disinfo unit, which was the, the, the first EU's response to, to uh, Russian disinformation campaigns, uh, the budget of this unit was zero in year one, zero in year two, zero in year three, and in year four, it got the first uh, million uh, million euro. So, so after three years, it got to a ratio of one to 2,000. <laughs> if the Russians are outnumbering us this heavily, they don't even need to be smart. <laughs> they are just beating us with the numbers. The second line is about raising awareness about this problem. So whereas in the first line, we are trying to collect more data, uh, in the second line, we are trying to spread it among more people. Uh, the idea behind this is uh, that if you manage to explain to, to the target audiences how disinformation works, what is it trying to achieve, what are its uh, TTPs, uh, they will not fall for it so easily. Many teams that are involved in line one uh, are also involved in line two. So the EU versus disinformation is doing both the documentation and the raising awareness uh, for their audiences. Uh, my, my other previous team, Digital Forensic Research Lab in the Atlantic Council, is also doing both. Um, the MPF, the Swedish uh, Psychological Defense Agency, is also doing documentation and, and uh, raising awareness. Uh, but, but not all of the teams are actually doing, doing uh, the same. Um, I think the key here in the second, second line of defense is, is numbers. Uh, different actors are always reaching different audiences. Uh, the information environment is now significantly more fragmented than it used to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We, we cannot hope that a governmental press release or, or mainstream media will reach 90% of the population as it used to be the case in, let's say, 2005. Um, different audiences simply need different, different speakers. Um, 
another tool that really helps in this regard is, is using humor. And again, Ukraine is a brilliant example of that. Once you, once you start using humorous uh, communication content, uh, the content reaches significantly bigger audience than, than the boring, boring press release or, or a boring article. The work that NAFO fellows are doing is, is, is obviously instrumental in this regard as well. One, one good example is that if, if you manage to raise awareness high enough, you can manage to kill a disinformation story before it even has time to spread, which is probably the ideal result of countering disinformation. Once, once the lie reaches the brain of the target audience, it is extremely difficult uh, to, to change that back, to explain to the target audience that they were wrong. Nobody wants to admit that they were wrong. But if you manage to raise awareness high enough that, that the disinformation doesn't even penetrate the brains of the target audiences, this is, this is the ideal result. And, and then you don't have to deal with, with the biggest problem of them all. Uh, some other words you could find uh, in the, in the counter-disinformation uh, file are, are pre-bunking, uh, inoculation, vaccination. Uh, to me, it seems all just different words to, for, for raising awareness. We are trying to explain how disinformation works. We are trying to warn the target audiences. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is where it's coming from. This is what it's trying to achieve. These are the typical messages and narratives that are being spread. And thus, we are trying to vaccinate the target audiences so that they don't fall it so easily. Uh, line three, repairing the weaknesses in the information ecosystems. Um, here we are trying to decrease the target for, for the disinformers. A lot of that work will be done by line two, by raising awareness. However, some of the repairing, a lot of the repairing actually, requires the work of some other people than just uh, communication specialists or media professionals. Uh, some of the work is, is uh, really for other, so to say, governmental institutions or, or even other uh, civil society actors. So here, uh, tools like, like media literacy are very important. In a, in a society where the media literacy is at a higher level, the disinformers have obviously a tougher job. A society that recognizes uh, which sources of information are more solid than others uh, is more resilient to, to information aggression. Uh, another tool, strategic communication. If we manage to explain what our society is about, uh, then the disinformers have it harder to lie about what we stand for, because this is a big part, big part of their job. Mm, another weakness that gets heavily abused by the information aggressors and that uh, that is very often mentioned in the media or, or in uh, conferences similar to this one, social media platforms. They are obviously still uh, an ecosystem where, where the uh, disinformation finds a lot of, uh, lot of fertile ground. But it's not just about the social media, it's also about the traditional media environment. And here we need at least two things. We, we both need strengthening of the condition of the solid media. And in countries where you see that the media environment is stronger, again, disinformers have it harder. But also the journalists themselves or the newsroom themselves, I think they could still step up when it comes to countering disinformation. And unfortunately, we still see that some of the disinformation narratives can penetrate even the traditional media uh, in Europe or North America. So there was this idea mentioned by uh, Peter Pomerantsev and Michael Weiss back in, I think, 2014 already in the study called Menace of Unreality. And one of the recommendations they, they had was that big media houses should hire something they called disinformation editors, somebody who would be, who would be familiar with the most recent disinformation narratives and, and every story would have to run through them so that they would be able to veto it in case it uh, amplifies some of the uh, notorious disinformation narratives. But another weakness that gets heavily abused are, are socio-economic tensions, and they might be different from country to country. In the United States, it would probably be the racial question. Um, the racial question is not such a big issue in my home country, in Czech Republic, but for some reason, uh, the, the migration issue uh, was, was uh, quite a big topic, despite us having close to no migrants from the Middle East. Uh, obviously, now we have a lot of, lot of refugees from, from Ukraine. Um, uh, in other countries, it might be the LGBT uh, question that gets heavily abused by, by the disinformers. It might be the tensions between the capital and the, and the rural areas, between the people with uh, higher income and lower income, 
between the people who are better educated uh, and pe people who are who are less educated working on these tensions uh, trying to decrease these dividing lines this definitely helps you when when it comes to fight against disinformation you can see that in the countries where the social cohesion is bigger where the dividing lines are not as strong not as deep uh, again disinformers have it have it a bit harder and finally the fourth line limiting punishing deterring of the information aggressors the first three lines were all about us as, as the victims of the information attacks uh, trying to build up our resilience, trying to build up our defense. The fourth line is about trying to limit the capabilities of the aggressors. Because if we focus only on our defense, uh, the aggressors always adapt. They, they always change their modus operandi. They, they always try something new whenever they see that, that we applied new modus of, of defense. So therefore, we need to try and, and decrease their capabilities or their will to fight as well otherwise I, otherwise they will just continue continue to uh, do us harm and here are again multiple tools that can be used a simple naming and shaming uh, and it it looks a bit uh, self-evident now especially when it comes to the russians but it used to be still quite controversial to call out russians as as disinformers just a couple of years ago um when it comes to calling out China as, as a big uh, uh, actor in the disinformation space, it is still being considered uh, controversial in some countries now, uh, despite the fact that they are quite, quite active in that regard as well. Um, ridiculing of the information aggressors, this is again something that they, that they hate. I already mentioned the NAFO fellas, they are doing a brilliant job in that regard. Uh, the Twitter account Darth Putin KGB that is mocking the Kremlin's uh, disinformation campaigns was a target of the Kremlin. You could see that they really hate uh, this in the information space. Uh, so, so it is it is a tool that can impose some costs on the on the bad actors. Labeling uh, false information or the sources that are spreading false information. This is another tool that I think we could use significantly more often. It is a tool that we are using against another substance that we do not want to ban, but we want to warn the people that it is harmful, and that is tobacco. Uh, we are not banning tobacco, but we are putting a big fat sign on each cigarette box, smoking will kill you. And we should do the same with uh, known disinformation oriented outlets. Uh, Two like sanctions, both against the individuals and against the organizations. Uh, we could still step up in, in both of these regards. I still think it is a shame that so many Western companies were paying uh, dozens of millions of US dollars for advertisement on Russian state TV. They were paying for the anti-Western propaganda. It is a little bit like in that old saying from, from Lenin that uh, capitalists will be selling us the rope with which we will hang them. All the companies that were buying advertisement time on Russian state TV, which is the main tool for spreading anti-Western propaganda, they were doing exactly that. They were buying the rope uh, with which Russia was trying to hang us. And finally, uh, investigations, um, mainly from the governmental level. I think the civil society actors, the media, they are doing quite a lot in this regard, and I, uh, and I want to thank them for that. But I think we should see more investigations from the governmental level. I, I do think it is a shame that so far the only election interference that was probably uh, properly investigated uh, was the interference in the United States. Uh, but in Europe, we had at least two dozen elections and referenda targeted by Russian information attacks uh, since 2014, since this renewed information aggression from the Kremlin. And I do not recall any single similar investigation to, to the Robert Mueller's investigation, not a single one. We are basically inviting more attacks. We are telling to the Russians, we do not even investigate it. Feel free to continue. Nothing will happen to you. I think that's a very bad message. And, and that means inviting more information attacks, not just from the Russians, but also from the other aggressors who see that we do not punish even the number one, number one information aggressor. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Let me stop here, but I will be happy to elaborate on any of this in the uh, Q&A session. Thank you, Jakob. That was a great contribution. Thank you. Um, so I did say he would have quite the toolkit there, and I, I think we're going to hear from Thomas Chaponis here, um, who's the Strategic Communication Specialist at the Hybrid Threats Resilience Group at the Ministry of National Defence in Lithuania. And he can speak very much to what toolkit, what suite of countermeasures that they are finding effective or they are trying to tailor to the challenges 
um, and the uh, I suppose once they've put a kind of parameter on what exactly they're facing. So I think it's really interesting after hearing Jakob um, speaking of all of the things that are available, how on the front line that actually works. So if you could welcome Thomas, please. Right. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the Ambassador, uh, ladies, gentlemen, it's a really great pleasure to be here and uh, share our experience and knowledge uh, on this topic. Uh, and uh, please, while I'm talking, uh, put my slides on and uh, I continue. Uh, I believe uh, now understanding this uh, in Lithuania that the uh, informational field is um, one of the um, pole of uh, any country. Uh, then we are looking at different uh, analysis model of different countries anyway environment or uh, information environment is one of the strongest tool and uh, which we supposed somehow uh, protect and in order to protect it uh, first of all we need to understand what is happening in our informational environment All right, so we have uh, slides. Um, so in time provided, I'm gonna talk about uh, six main steps which we are using in Lithuania in order, in order to protect our information and environment. Uh, so next slide, please. I believe that everything started uh, that, uh, first of all, we need to understand and recognize what kind of challenge, what kind of uh, problem uh, we have. Uh, it's, uh, I think in the democratic societies, this is the uh, first step. And um, I think one of the key points is that we are living in democratic uh, societies and uh, democratic countries is uh, really a smaller part of uh, global population. Uh, so probably only one billion from eight billion. So we definitely need to protect it. Uh, in theory, we can find that uh, democratic system is a political system which is uh, the most vulnerable for disinformation propaganda. And we had to put plenty of effort, effort uh, in order to protect uh, our societies from influence of uh, disinformation. Uh, later on, uh, I believe that the core of any democratic country is a society. So societies is a target which uh, authoritarian regime, disinformation, propaganda are trying uh, to hit. And it looks uh, like uh, that we are taking for granted that uh, citizens who were born in the a democratic country, somehow they are supposed to understand that it's uh, probably the best system in which uh, they are living. And uh, they, from from very beginning of their life, they are supposed to understand what kind of values we have in with democratic countries. But I believe it, uh, it's really not so. And especially that we now have uh, traditional uh, media anymore. So for me, it's even a question what kind of uh, tools of communication our governments uh, have at the moment in order to somehow we have a possibility to talk with our societies. Uh, today was provided uh, plenty of examples that uh, pretty big parts of our societies were receiving information from different, uh, different social media platforms. And uh, it looks like uh, some of them, they are completely closed in these platforms. So in these cases, uh, um, our governments, our states, they have no possibility somehow to provide real uh, trustful information. So how we can expect from our societies that they would be united and they would follow main direction, which is, uh, let's say, aimed by our uh, countries. Uh, later on, um, Definitely. We all know that we are living in the information environment, so it's a completely global information environment. And in comparison to what we had uh, just 20, 30 years ago, it's uh, completely changed, actually. Now we all are interconnected, and it's definitely good. We really like it, and we really enjoy it. But in, from a uh, point of view of information operation, uh, PSYOPs and uh, uh, other capabilities, uh, it's also golden times to doing these kind of activities. It's pretty easy to do information operation from China to uh, Canada or Australia or any other countries because there is no other, no actual uh, restriction who can, let's say, interrupt in this kind of, of your activities. So again, it's, this is one of the challenge. And uh, 
for the countries, democratic countries which still have no kind of a system how to protect their uh, information environment, uh, my suggestion is definitely to start to organize the system because it takes years in order to create uh, this kind of uh, establishment in, in your country. And if we look at last decade, we already saw so many different challenges. Uh, annexation of Crimea, uh, later on ISIS, uh, later on COVID situation when, let's say, this situation was uh, even better used against our countries uh, by some authoritarian regimes as we were able to explain for our societies what is happening. Uh, later on, full-scale war in Ukraine, now war in Israel. So I do anticipate that in the near future definitely will be no uh, very peaceful, uh, no challenges uh, time frame for us. So in order to have the system, we definitely need to start to create it uh, today. Next slide, please. All right, uh, so uh, from previous presentation, we already get information and it's also our understanding in Lithuania from that our enemies, uh, authoritarian regimes, they definitely have the system. So, um, Global narrative, they are created by universities. Uh, later on, we have uh, plenty of resources uh, mentioned uh, by um, uh, previous speaker. Uh, definitely, we have uh, plenty of different tools uh, which are preset uh, well before they need to do some influence in some specific areas. Uh, so we can talk about a specific narrative in order to promote um, um, specific system in order to prom promote their uh, team's messages and, and narrative. So I believe in order to do something against it, we also need to create this kind of narrative. And it was actually the first step in Lithuania. Uh, then uh, the guys with uh, PSYOPs training and information operation training, uh, they uh, did the first investigation of our information environment and they understood that classic uh, um, PSYOPs, InfoOps operation are uh, happening in our country and our population is, in a, um, let's say, poisoned uh, by disinformation and propaganda. So in order to do something against it, they need to find guys who also get the experience and understanding uh, how it's happening. And uh, uh, surprisingly, it's really, it was really possible to find these counterparts and later on they connect them to the networks and the European Union and NATO and some other international organizations is a very good platform uh, to gather this kind of specialist in one uh, place and later on we can share uh, our experience. Next please. So our uh, understanding who might be, let's say, part of your country networks and it's a uh, really very different um, representative of your country. I believe that uh, single citizens, if you have uh, will, if they have uh, understanding, capability uh, to do something uh, and fight against Russian disinformation, definitely they can take part in this uh, struggle. Uh, probably the best well-known uh, case uh, when we are talking about citizens, it's the uh, Lithuanian elves community, elves who are fighting Russian trolls online. So um, initially it was just a couple of guys, later on they created kind of organization. Now we even have uh, some training courses for these kind of activities. So uh, I believe it's a very good example. Later on media, I think uh, um, information environment, it's a main, uh, let's say, working area for media. So if, uh, let's say, this area is completely filled by disinformation and propaganda, like how we can arrange, uh, let's say, job of our media, if we, how we can, you know, find a way between all these uh, strange messages in this uh, field. And also, if we are talking about education, uh, uh, it's a pretty wide topic, but if we are talking about education in the schools, so it definitely takes plenty of time in order to train part of our society, because this is just a part of our society. I believe media, again, here, uh, by writing some articles, uh, researchers, analysis, uh, they can um, teach our, uh, let's say, population on, on this topic uh, on, on a daily basis. Uh, academia, definitely. But again, uh, democratic countries, they have some challenges, so... Usually our scientists, they're supposed to come with answer what to do and uh, what, uh, what our actions might be. And uh, I'm really very happy that uh, looking at Lithuanian universities, probably all of them, they have uh, at least somebody who are dealing uh, with this topic. And uh, nowadays, uh, after events, um, 
from, let's say, 2014 occupation and annexation of uh, Crimea, we also started to uh, be very interested in uh, hybrid different activities. So again, um, academia also, um, let's say, now doing investigation on this uh, topic. Later on, uh, business and entrepreneurs, if you look at our um, media channels, if we look at the biggest uh, global uh, social media platforms, they are all in uh, private hands. Even uh, if we look at uh, movies, TV serials, another production, again, it's, uh, it is, uh, let's say, in private hand in a democratic country. So without cooperation with them, without explaining these challenges uh, for them, it's uh, really very difficult to achieve uh, some specific uh, results. States, we have plenty of responsibility, so it's uh, follow on in, in my uh, next slides. Uh, but probably the strongest tool uh, is uh, laws. And um, uh, uh, at the very end of the uh, presentation, I will provide some specific uh, examples from Lithuania, how we are trying to use law in order to stop uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, disinformation, and propaganda. And the last point in previous slide was about uh, NATO and European Union. So if overall, uh, from the theoretical uh, point, we look at the strategic communication, so it's uh, in internal philosophical understanding. But despite the fact what kind of uh, job you are doing and what you are responsible for, uh, communication line is uh, your must responsibility. So if the uh, European Union understands that we have um, area for, of responsibility, and if NATO understands that we have area of responsibility, definitely they're supposed to at least to understand what is happening in uh, this area information environment. And I'm very happy that in the last decade, so many different uh, units were created, uh, so many documents were created or changed or adapted in order to um, do some activities against authoritarian regime uh, propaganda and disinformation. So documenting of threats, uh, so why it is useful and uh, uh, so, if you're starting to deal uh, with the disinformation propaganda, so you cannot, you know, do something one week and later on take a holidays for a couple of weeks and later on restart your activities, because you need, need data. You need to understanding and visibility of what is happening and what your enemies are doing against you. And later on, when you have experience of a couple of years, when you have uh, databases, you can compare uh, these data and even anticipate uh, future actions which you can expect, uh, expect uh, from your possible enemies. And also, it was mentioned today, and it's really very important, uh, we also did um, different investigation in, in uh, like um, Riga Stratcom uh, Center of Excellence and also uh, Helsinki Hybrid Center. Then we compare uh, procedures and the narrative of uh, Russian activity in different countries. And we, first of all, we're very surprised that we are repeating the same operations. Uh, we are trying to sell the same narrative for different countries. For example, topic of the history. Uh, not mentioned uh, very uh, strongly today, but I believe the biggest struggle uh, for you know, the info battle for Ukraine was fight for their history. Also, it's an uh, everyday struggle for Lithuania, fight for our history. But uh, our point uh, of view is that actually Russia created a kind of history books uh, for all countries on the world. So they only they know real history of our countries, and they are let's say, communicating on this um, kind of uh, narrative. All right, next, please. Uh, so just to imagine what the kind of job is in order to, let's say, um, follow Russian uh, disinformation activities, there are so many different tools, so many different channels, so many different audiences. And uh, maybe a couple of years ago, we understood that major uh, tools were um, TV, but uh, today definitely with uh, appearing of social media influence and uh, not limiting to it, uh, we look at the, we're supposed to look at different conferences. Uh, we're supposed to look at the uh, cultural products. Uh, some part of uh, this information is spread through the sport and some other activities. So definitely this is a responsibility not for one unit. Um, I believe that that's why countries are supposed to have a system in order to uh, follow all these uh, possible influence. Next topic, next slide, please. 
Yes, uh, probably the first uh, um, information which we get about uh, that Russia is uh, doing disinformation and propaganda, it was classified material which we read in the secret uh, military reports. Uh, but later on, we understood that it's really not enough to read it in the classified uh, uh, reports. Uh, probably the strongest um, move in the, in the country would be if we would be able to share this information with our society. Because by sharing uh, this uh, information, we, all, we can educate our society. We somehow inoculate our society against uh, disinformation and propaganda. And also media, it was one of the uh, very good tools uh, in Lithuania in, or in order to share this uh, information with uh, society. And definitely the banking and pre-banking, uh, if we are able uh, to share uh, with our society this knowledge, uh, educate on this topic, so sometimes uh, even uh, we could uh, stop a kind of uh, spread of disinformation cases in the country if before this uh, information do some influence of our society. Next slide, please. Um, yes, I already mentioned that the uh, democratic system uh, is a political system, is which is pretty difficult to protect. Uh, but I believe that the democratic countries, uh, they also have their muscles, they also have their teeth. And uh, so we simply need to uh, create uh, the system, we simply need to adjust and adapt and if we need to create uh, new laws, uh, establish some specific organization who uh, would have understanding and also will to fight against uh, these activities and the democratic system uh, could be protected. Next slide, please. Uh, it's really not very popular topic when we are looking at the democratic countries and it definitely was not very popular in the very beginning when we started to, to uh, understand uh, how to use uh, existing law system in our country in order to protect our information environment. And I still remember when we were able to punish first Russian TV channel of, uh, on disinformation and propaganda in Lithuania. Unfortunately, um, our uh, partners from other countries and from um, European Union, they were not very happy. Probably they thought that, you know, censorship times are coming back to Lithuania. So they even uh, organized a kind of conference for Lithuania just to explain for us uh, uh, what is uh, freedom of speech, what is uh, uh, real democratic uh, media. But I believe when they arrived to Lithuania and we told uh, our story for them, uh, somehow they understood what is what is mean to live in, uh, let's say, info war environment in, in our countries. And later on, we were very happy that uh, we get the answer from European Union that uh, everything what we did in Lithuania against uh, disinformation and propaganda actually was completely in line with um, European Union, uh, European Union law system. Next, please. And uh, for very beginning, uh, for very end of my presentation, this is uh, probably one of a couple last uh, slides. Uh, just I'm gonna provide one of example, uh, not not fresh one, but uh, this situation was uh, completely investigation. So now now we can present it as uh, full um, information all operation example. Uh, so first of all, it was created uh, narrative or messages uh, with uh, pretty sensitive um, information. Uh, in Lithuania, we have in the hands forward present uh, German battalion together with some other uh, soldiers. So they use this opportunity and created a story, uh, history um, story uh, that uh, German soldiers in one of the town in Lithuania, they with tanks, they entered into Jewish cemetery and actually they somehow. Uh, did some damage um, in the beginning of the cemetery, and also some Nazi symbols were placed in a uh, different uh, uh, location in the cemetery. So, yeah, sensitive story. But it looks silly from the distance. And also, first of all, we put the story in um, newly created uh, web page. And definitely, we all know that if you create a new web page, who might find uh, this information? So, in order to spread this information, they use uh, very simple techniques. Uh, they attach this information to electronic mails and they sell, uh, send it into a different organization. So, the governmental institution, uh, also for media, also for some international organization. 
and uh, it was, let's say, first attempt to spread this information. Unfortunately, we were surprised that some Western uh, magazines and newspapers, they took the story for granted. Uh, later on, we used the opportunity to call them, and the, first of all, we don't want to talk with a governmental representative because they thought that we are hiding the story from them. So we find, uh, let's say, um, uh, locals in Lithuania who were able to speak their language from their communities. So they called them and they said, come on, you need to check this information before placing them in, in your, let's say, media resources. So again, it uh, shows for us that uh, not all Western media resources, they are prepared for this kind of disinformation spread. But it was not the end. Uh, later on, we um, encountered a cyber attack in the country. And one of the local um, internet news page was defaced, and uh, this story was uh, placed in this um, news uh, outlet as a real story, as a real article with all, you know, names of journalists uh, and all. It was re really interesting to see because I was following this uh, news, um, uh, let's say, internet news portal, and I saw it on my phone that when we were changing this information. And uh, again, the story looks uh, silly, but uh, it's a really very emotional story for our environment, and we thought uh, why they created the story, uh, because uh, locals definitely do not believe in on this kind of story. So later on, we recognize that uh, our president uh, at the same time had meeting with uh, international Jewish community and also our Minister of Foreign Affairs, they have a couple of meetings with uh, Jewish community. Just simply imagine that uh, you as a minister are meeting with, uh, let's say, Jewish community from around the world and you are saying about our relationship, about heritage, heritage of Jews in Lithuania and they say, come on, you know, German tanks are in our cemeteries and you are talking about friendship. So I think it's a kind of um, uh, strong story. But uh, when you are looking at this case, uh, just simply remind, let's see, remember uh, these points which we are talking before. Uh, so in order to stop this, uh, definitely we use uh, cyber uh, capabilities to understand how, let's say, this internet web page was uh, attacked by cyber. So later on, we use uh, our, uh, let's say, counterparts in media just in order to create in a few hours article and explain for our society that it's a lie story. And also later on to provide this um, uh, evidences uh, for, let's say, our counterparts from other countries that it's really not a real case, but it's an informational operation. So you need to have a system in order to stop these kind of, of activities, just like example. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm really very proud about activities which we were able to do in the country before the uh, kinetic phase of war in Ukraine last year. Uh, but definitely it was much easier to achieve some results um, after the beginning of war. It's completely understandable because now everybody have emotional, let's say, uh, feelings and to do some specific results and proof about uh, uh, that Russia is doing uh, war propaganda, is trying to instigate some heat rate in our society, it's much easier. So as you see here, uh, many channels uh, were uh, closed, Russian TV channels were closed in Lithuania uh, by government, uh, because the uh, first two weeks of war uh, was uh, there are plenty of uh, war propaganda on these TV channels, so our radio and TV commission managed to do it. Uh, but also our entrepreneurs, uh, for whom belongs uh, cable TV uh, service, they completely removed Russian TV production from their services. And what is interesting here that uh, Russia actually sued the uh, Radio and TV Commission because of the action, but they did completely nothing against uh, owners of uh, uh, cable TV channels. So it simply shows that uh, when you have a system, sometimes it's better to react from governmental level, sometimes it's better to react from society or entrepreneurs community or non-governmental organization. And uh, yes, uh, there are still plenty of information which are influence our society. Probably the biggest challenge is uh, different uh, social media platforms uh, with plenty of information circulating within them and uh, we do understood uh, that uh, when we're approaching from Lithuanian level, it's uh, pretty difficult to change something. So that's why we believe that when we're approaching a couple of countries or uh, from uh, name of uh, European Union, it's uh, much easier to solve these uh, challenges. Next, please. 
or I believe it's the last slide of my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. And later on, if some question arises, I will try to answer to them. Thank you. Use this. this. Um, Carl, thank you for your patience and thank you very much, Tomas, for that comprehensive um, rundown of what Lithuania has been doing. You can see there's a lot of work involved. Um, finally, but, but absolutely crucially, we have Carl Stoltz, who's Senior Advisor in the State Department, the US State Department's Global Engagement Centre. Um, Carl is a, has, has much diplomatic uh, service under his belt, but his role in the GEC is really, really important in understanding, I suppose, holistically, um, the challenge across the world. So Russian disinformation is what we're talking about today, but Carl and the GEC tackle um, a number of different campaigns from a number of different sources. And I'm sure he can speak to that. And Carl, I, I hate to limit you, but I might have to keep you to a top of 15 minutes just to make sure that we, um, I know we, we started a bit late, but just to make sure that I have a chance to open this to the floor because I think people have heard lots of information and may have it specific questions and I'd love to get to those before um, we, we let everybody else go about their afternoon. So thank you, Carl, I'll let you speak. Thank you, and you can hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, yes, and thank you for uh, uh, giving me that great introduction and thank you for uh, uh, limiting me because uh, I'm happy to speak uh, for less time and a lot more time for questions. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, the speakers that have come before me for covering this issue so well. Uh, a lot of things that I might have said, they've said, so I can save some time there. Um, and I'd like to wish uh, everyone Dobry Dien, Labadiena, uh, and uh, any other language you speak. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, speaking to you from uh, Washington, D.C., where it's still morning. Uh, and as, uh, as introduced, I work for the Global Engagement Center, and uh, the Global Engagement Center has uh, a rather short history. We've only been around for seven and a half years. Um, previously, the uh, U.S. government, U.S. State Department had an organization called the Center for Strategic Communications and Counter Disinformation, uh, CSCC. Um, that was focused, it was created after 9-11, and it was focused very much on the awareness that uh, terrorist organizations were able to use the internet and social media very effectively to spread their propaganda and recruit new members. So we created an organization that could keep an eye on what terrorist groups were saying online uh, and their efforts to try to recruit members and identify targets uh, with people with language capability to be aware of what was being said in that space. Because traditionally, I think, uh, Governments around the world, people around the world have focused on what's being said in the media, uh, but have not been able to or aware of what's being said on social media, which is a um, is the primary way that most people now get their information. Um, the little uh, phone that most of you probably have in your pocket, hopefully on silence right now, um, but uh, most of you, I think, find that most of your information every day, uh, what is in the news, comes from that device. And uh, I think that uh, it, it was quicker for countries like Russia to discover the power of that device to deliver news unfiltered without going through editors, station managers, um, other ways that would block uh, extremist views. Uh, they, could, they could use these devices to reach every person in every country and, uh, and benefit themselves. And uh, the GEC was formed after the 2016 U.S. elections. I know uh, Jakob mentioned uh, the impact of disinformation on elections. Um, it was formed after the 2016 elections. Uh, one of the last uh, uh, things that President Obama signed into office uh, with support from both parties in Congress uh, to look not only at messages online from terrorist organizations, but also information online from uh, countries that we consider to be malign actors trying to uh, defeat our uh, and our allies' global interests. So that was uh, North Korea, which, to be honest, is not very effective at messaging outside of North Korea, so we don't spend a lot of time focused there. Uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which certainly does have a global network that we're seeing more and more of uh, daily now. Um, People's Republic of China, and then Russia. And since we are focused today on Russia, uh, keep my uh, thoughts targeted on that. 
Um, under Putin, uh, the Kremlin, Russia has discovered that it is very uh, uh, profitable to engage in an active campaign of what used to be called active measures in the Soviet Union, uh, but basically um, ongoing efforts to advance Russia's interests globally by um, undermining uh, societies that they think uh, oppose them. They're not necessarily pushing their own political views publicly. Uh, we don't have a problem with that. Uh, we support the right of every person to say whatever they want to say and to read whatever they want to read. Uh, the problem that we focus on in the GEC is uh, manipulation of information, manipulation of the internet and social media algorithms to either hide the identity of the person who is providing this information or to use things like bots and trolls and other devices to boost to the algorithm to try to make sure that uh, their particular messages reach wider audiences and get more attention than other messages. Um, and in the case of Russia, we have found from our uh, uh, seven and a half years of analysis in the GC, uh, they often are not at all interested in things that are specifically devoted to the interests of Russia. What they're interested in doing is causing chaos, uh, disrupting uh, public institutions in other societies, uh, causing people not to trust their own governments and, and their own leaders and their own media. Because uh, in Russia's, uh, I think, distorted view of the world today, uh, the more chaos, the less um, support for democracies, the more they can profit. And you see this across Africa with the exploits of the Wagner Group and whatever will succeed it. You see this uh, around the world. We just did an exposure report two weeks ago about a group in Latin America, Russian control, uh, a fake think tank, tank, a pseudo think tank, and a, a sort of pseudo political party called New Resistance, Nova Resistencia in Brazil. Um, they openly support uh, neo Nazi. Uh, ideologies, and they seek to bring down the governments in their countries in Latin America uh, and replace them with authoritarian regimes tied to Russia. So um, there are networks globally where Russia uh, works to try to uh, create a lack of support for their own governmental institutions. Uh, let me give a couple of quick anecdotes to illustrate this, um, and then I can talk as we've already heard. Uh, other speakers discuss solutions. Um, the first anecdote comes from 2017 when I was teaching at George Washington University before I was part of the Global Engagement Center. Um, and uh, at that time in 2017 in America, there was a controversy that some of you may remember um, about a, uh, a, a player in American gridiron football uh, called Colin Kaepernick who decided to kneel during the national anthem to protest the uh, condition for African Americans uh, in the country. And other players joined him. Uh, and that uh, became quite a um, story for a few months in the United States. Um, we did an analysis, uh, some graduate students at George Washington and I, of 250,000 messages on social media in the two-month period after that. Over 65% of them did not come from the United States. Now, there are not a lot of fans of American style um, football. It's not Gaelic football. It's not the real beautiful game. It's uh, the American version. Uh, there aren't a lot of fans of NFL football in other countries. So that was rather odd. And we looked further and we discovered that most of those messages came from St. Petersburg, Russia. And what Russia was doing was going onto social media platforms uh, and pages. If there was an African American, they were posting that these people are merely trying to do peaceful protests and, and they're being punished for it and you need to rise up and, and fight for them. And at the same time, they were going on to uh, conservative right-wing uh, social media sites and saying these people are um, spitting on the flag, they are stomping on the graves of veterans, you need to rise up and fight them. There's no real Russian interest in that. They were just trying to provoke social tension and conflict in the United States. And when we analyzed 
Russian disinformation patterns in almost every country in the world. We find the same thing. They take an existing social issue, whatever causes some uh, debate in that country, and then they try to amplify it. They try to make it uh, more severe, more acute, and bring down uh, the stability of the country, uh, especially active in election time when there's a natural division and debate uh, between political parties. And um, one of the things the GEC has done at the request of other governments is look into uh, social media um, platforms in the country prior to the election. Um, let me clarify, we're not reading individual posts. We're not looking to see what you said to your grandmother, uh, but we're using uh, metadata, which is looking for trends, looking at zeros and ones and trying to see uh, patterns and commonalities. So if the same uh, comment appears uh, 100 times at the same moment on 100 different pages, that's not a coincidence. We know it's uh, orchestrated. So um, looking at countries uh, several months before their election when the government asked us to take a look, uh, we've discovered that anywhere between 15 and 30 percent of websites and social media influencers are not actually uh, from the host country, not, not who they pretend, pretend to be. And that's been pretty consistent across every country where we've looked. So the problem of disinformation, particularly Russian disinformation, creeping into domestic narratives, pretending to be domestic audiences, is pretty much global. And depending on the platform that is most popular in each country and the different means of doing it, uh, Russia invests very heavily. Uh, we know from studying Russian budget figures that at least $1.5 billion a year, U.S., uh, is invested by Russia in uh, disinformation operations. Uh, but we expect that it's probably closer to 4 to $6 billion if you include the um, mercenary companies and other, uh, other forms of investment. And that doesn't in even include the budget of things like RT and Sputnik. So uh, if you look at the uh, state.gov, our, our website, uh, uh, www.state.gov, uh, there's a section called Disarming, Disarming Disinformation where we have all of our reports and we talk about the uh, pillars of disinformation that the Russians use, the network that they operate to spread their disinformation, just as we talk about how China does it uh, a little more subtly and, and quietly, but still ubiquitously. Um, and if you read our latest China report, you may not want to uh, be on TikTok longer because you'll see how uh, the TikTok company shares user data uh, directly with Chinese embassies in many countries. At this point, primarily to look at people who are ethnically Chinese living in those countries to make sure they're behaving according to Beijing wishes, but uh, with the potential to share it for on others as well. Um, so in the GEC, we're looking at how malign actors are abusing uh, social media and the internet to try to advance their goals. I promised another anecdote, and the one I will give is um, is one that troubles me a lot. Uh, in uh, Before COVID, about 97% of the world had either already been vaccinated or expressed a desire to get vaccinated soon. Now, we all know uh, what we went through with the pandemic, and we know how many people had very legitimate concerns about uh, the efficacy of vaccines or wearing masks or those sorts of things, uh, and passed possibly passed on misinformation about that, uh, which is different from disinformation. Misinformation means you don't know it's true or not, uh, and you share it. Disinformation means you know it's false and you share it anyway. Um, so there was misinformation and misperceptions being spread. But the Russians and Chinese in particular, the Chinese to hide uh, debate over uh, the possible origins of COVID, uh, the Russians, for who knows what means, other than to just bring down trust in uh, governments and health ministries and doctors, um, spread a lot of false information about the risks of vaccines. Um, and they did that globally. And as a result of that, now about 80% of the world uh, intends to ever be vaccinated, them and their family members. And as a result of that, not only have we had more uh, impact from COVID than we might have, but we've also seen a rise for the first time in years of smallpox, um, polio, even uh, leprosy. Diseases that we thought were part of ancient history are now returning to the world 
because Russia saw advantage in bringing down trust in doctors and governments um, through spreading false rumors about COVID. And, and I think you can probably find uh, in just about every country in the world, uh, maybe among some of your own relatives, the misperception that vaccines are dangerous. So that's just one example of how disinformation could impact the entire world. Uh, obviously, we're focused here on uh, Russia's aggressive campaign of disinformation against Ukraine and to, dis uh, and to discredit uh, allies supporting Ukraine. Uh, and there are many examples on our website that I won't go into here to save time, but uh, you can read a lot more about some of the things that we have uncovered uh, with Ukraine. Uh, some of the other speakers mentioned pre-bunking, and I will just uh, say that that is a tool we have used in the GEC. Um, it, it, we have to be careful how we use it because we do not want to become the boy who cried wolf. Uh, if you say it too often, people will start to not believe you. But what we have found to be useful for pre-bunking is if we know in advance that there's going to be a Russian disinformation campaign and we think it brings a uh, threat to people's security, we will sometimes compromise the sources we have and uh, put out that information before the campaign begins. We did it uh, when we had evidence that the Russians were planning to invade Ukraine, and many were saying that was not true and not possible. Uh, we put out the information before the actual invasion occurred that it was definitely going to happen, and indeed it did. Um, another example is in um, about uh, 10 months ago, uh, we had evidence the Russians were planning to blame Ukraine for launching a dirty bomb, uh, a bomb that is exploded with conventional means but contains radiation. And we knew that they were talking about uh, accusing Ukraine of this, but we didn't have any more details until we observed that in one part of the front, they were issuing uh, gas masks and uh, uh, chem bio suits, uh, hazmat gear to troops. Now, if you're about to get hit by a surprise attack, you don't usually prepare your troops in advance for that. So when we saw them doing that, we realized they were planning to do a dirty bomb in that location, and we went public with it against you know, the arguments of some who consider that to be uh, intelligence they did not want to leak. But um, we put that out. The Russians stopped the campaign. Uh, they haven't launched a dirty bomb and tried to blame it on Ukraine since. Maybe they still will. I can't promise anything with Russia, but by going public with that before they launched it, we prevented a, uh, a nuclear-related uh, attack in, in, uh, in Ukraine. So on occasion, we will go public with pre-bunking when we think that there's extra value in it. We did this most recently by exposing this uh, neo-fascist uh, organization trying to take down governments in uh, Latin America. Other times, we report after the fact when we do our um, countering, we don't try to take on the specific argument because you get into a uh, vicious cycle of uh, that's a lie, no it's not, yes it is, no it's not, and audiences tend to sort of lose interest. Uh, instead, what we try to do is talk about the history, the credibility of the source. So I'll finish with just one more example and then um, a couple ways forward that have already been mentioned. Um, the, uh, Another example is Russia's repeated trope that uh, is repeated by uh, many in their government, including uh, Putin on occasion, that the United States is, uh, or NATO or the West is developing biological laboratories, research laboratories in countries around the world to create diseases to um, uh, affect people. Um, this goes way back to the 1980s. The Soviet Union uh, is accusing the United States of creating just about every terrible disease then, AIDS, et cetera. Since then, Russia has tried to say that the United States created Ebola, COVID, of course, monkeypox, you name it. Any disease that has come out in the last uh, 40 years, uh, they try to blame on U.S. and more specifically U.S. military in secret bio labs. Uh, in the last year, they've said that we have secret military biological labs in Ukraine that are designing diseases that will only kill Slavs. Now, Ukrainians are Slavs, so I don't really understand why they would want to kill themselves, but that's the kind of thing with a lie. You don't need to make, it doesn't need to make sense if it scares people. Uh, in uh, Mongolia, they were putting out a lie that we were creating 
biological labs in Mongolia because we were concerned about the population of Asians on the planet, and we'd come up with a disease that would make all Asian women infertile. And with the help of Mongolia, for some odd reason, we were testing this. Um, obviously, not true. Anyone with any medical knowledge knows that could not be true. But it's, it triggers a basic human fear, and it scares people, and it makes them think. Even very knowledgeable people sort of scratch their head and say, maybe that's real. And that's the goal of the Russian disinformation machine. They don't care about the truth. They'll buy the same uh, four versions of, of, of a lie to explain the same thing. Uh, the truth doesn't matter. The causing the emotional reaction and causing the doubt does. So let me just conclude by uh, uh, talking about a few ways we help try to prevent this kind of uh, uh, infectious danger from uh, tearing down uh, societies around the world. Um, what, uh, several points have already been raised by the other speakers uh, uh, very well about how all the different tools that we can use to build awareness and resilience and help people be stronger against disinformation. I think it really comes down to every individual. Every person who receives their information on their cell phone needs to ask themselves where that information is coming from uh, before they believe it. Uh, I always say there are certain triggers that tell you you're about to receive disinformation. Uh, it used to be that if you got an email that began, I am a Nigerian prince uh, and I'd like to transfer some money to you, you might have read it, but now everyone's radar is up. So uh, if there are any real Nigerian princes out there trying to transfer money, they probably have a very hard time. I think we need to get the same kind of individual radars up about disinformation. Uh, the clue for me is if you ever uh, get a message uh, online that says what they don't want you to know or what the government doesn't want to tell you or you're the only person, you know, learning this secret from me, that should be like Nigerian Prince. That should be a trigger to uh, put your radar on. Um, but people need to check that information carefully. And the way to build awareness, there's, there's many ways. We have online games help people. Uh, there, there's many ways to help raise uh, public awareness, but the most important thing is uh, coalitions, international coalitions like uh, this group here today, uh, like uh, the many, many country, people around the world and uh, close partners of the GEC, several of whom are uh, here speaking today. Um, we just need to make sure that more and more of the world is aware of this threat that they don't realize exists in their phones. And, and the more the liars find it hard to find traction, the more they are sanctioned or identified, exposed, uh, the harder it will be for them to do their work. And, uh, and eventually they will become less effective and less profitable to countries like Russia that seek to do this because it's a cheap way to uh, get their goals. Um, I, I often say that uh, disinformation uh, is like a, a cockroach uh, a cockroach, uh, you know, comes, uh, has been around since the age of the dinosaurs, and they say it will survive nuclear war. So cockroaches will always, always be around, and sadly, so will lies and disinformation. But uh, if you keep your house very clean, uh, you may not have cockroaches, but if your neighbor doesn't keep their house so clean, you might uh, still find them in the house occasionally. All you can do is shine the light on them and try to plug the cracks. And that's what an international effort to try to deal with disinformation can do. We can uh, keep the light on them because they like to hide in the shadows. We can expose them when we can, and we can try to plug the holes that they try to use to get into everybody's mind. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm really excited to take questions. Okay, thank you, Carl. And Carl mentioned reports there um, that on, on the GEC, the State Department um, section there. I've, I've been into them and I've disappeared down the rabbit hole, but it's a good rabbit hole in this case, which I, I know is not always when we're talking about disinformation. So I'd recommend you check those out. Now, I'm mindful people may have other plans after this and we were to finish at this time at 2.30, but we did start a little bit later. So it's OK, I think, is it? To take a few questions, I'm sure. So I'm going to just forget about mine because I'm sure there are some in the audience and I really want to be able to give people a chance. So if, if anybody has a question, I'll get a mic. I'll get that lady there and then this gentleman here, I think. Do you have mics there at the back? So this lady here by the pillar was first. 
And if you could maybe um, say who you are and if you're directing it at anyone specifically as well, that'd be great. Thank you. Guys, there's other mics here, or you can use my one. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Olena Tregup, um, Executive Director of the Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Commission. It's a Ukrainian think tank. And uh, my question basically is to whoever wants uh, to answer from the panelists. Um, when I was listening to the panel, um, you all gave examples of how uh, our societies are free and how an uh, authoritarian country like Russia is using this vulnerability to uh, put cracks in our society. And indeed, these active measures, they were in place for decades and, and centuries. And uh, I just didn't get a feeling from you. How do you feel about the current state? Are we winning this information war or are we losing? And I just wanted to hear this like snapshots, like how do you feel about what you're doing and they're doing right now? Thank you. That sounds like a, a question for everybody. So I don't know if we want to start in, in the room here first. Uh, Tomas, do you want to? Yeah, very good question and uh, pretty often a uh, topic for the discussion. And uh, for the last 10 years, I believe, we are still asking uh, probably before the eve of Christmas, are we winning or we are losing? So our, my personal and uh, I believe in Lithuania, our understanding is that we started too late, we are doing too little and we are doing too weak. Uh, because, um, yeah, 2023, we're still talking about this information and propaganda. You're absolutely right. Uh, we can track uh, uh, Russian disinformation at least to Tsarist Russia time. Then uh, later on, uh, during the Cold War time, uh, we were both very good uh, Western countries and uh, Soviet bloc in doing disinformation propaganda. Uh, later on, we... Uh, Western countries, they stopped uh, these activities because we... We had an idea that uh, Russia somehow became a democratic country and uh, they are good uh, fellows now. And uh, we probably let all our specialists to the pension and uh, we um, locked all our experience in the file folders and put in the metal locker. So that's why it takes time to rebuild um, this system. So because the uh, kinetic phase of war started in Ukraine, uh, because we saw how uh, disinformation propaganda was, were used during the COVID time against us, uh, we have a social questioning um, data on uh, our society's view on the European Union, uh, our view on the NATO, our view and understanding about overall democracy system in our countries. So I cannot uh, say that we are winning. Well, I think we are putting uh, specialists who understand this uh, challenge, uh, putting plenty of effort, uh, but uh, not yet enough, I would say, support from other in institution in the country. So in a short way. Thank you. Alicia, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. It is uh, also the, the tricky one and not a pleasant one, I guess. Uh, we were talking with uh, one of the RAND cooperation specialists just a couple of, of weeks ago on uh, what is going on in Ukraine and uh, how Ukraine evolved since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. And the thing is, all the participants of the meeting uh, they were trying to say that Russia did that, Russia uh, is doing that, Russia say that, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in 2022, the world found itself in the place uh, designed by Russia. I am uh, talking about rhetorics around Ukraine, about so-called post-Soviet countries that were occupied by Russia, by Soviet Union previously. So we found ourselves in the world built by Russia with a rhetoric around us built by Russia. And uh, it is quite not quick for us to work um, from, from the beginning of the full-scale war uh, to, for the world to start to working on that. 
but this is better than nothing. So I'm not I'm not sure that we're winning as of now because Russia evolves really quickly. And uh, we were talking with, with colleagues from Ukraine that has an AI solution to analyze big data. Uh, Russia started to use AI, the first, uh, I guess, in the world, in doing uh, board farms campaigns. So it is already happening. We need to move faster. I think that's a very good point, Alicia. It's the scale of disinformation versus the impact that the countermeasures can have. And each time you're catching up on what has seemed to be an innovation and in, in what's being used in propaganda, by the time you've tackled that, they've moved on to something else. So it is a huge, huge issue. Jakob, uh, it's been quite a while since you've had a chance to speak. So I'd love to for you to have a chance to respond to that. I mean, it, it's a basic question. Are, are we winning? But it obviously opens a lot of doors to answers there. I do not believe we are. Uh, I think Thomas gave a brilliant answer. We started too late and we are still doing too little. Um, many Western commentators were claiming that that Ukraine has already won the information or already back in uh, March 2022. And I honestly do not believe uh, this is true. If we have a look at some of the opinion polls that are showing how many people in various European countries believe some of the Russian disinformation narratives, like, for example, the West is to blame for the war in Ukraine or uh, Americans at biolabs in Ukraine. We can see that it's 20, 30 percent of a population in, in, in countries like Hungary, Bulgaria, Italy, Greece. This is not what winning looks like. 20 or 30 percent of population can get you a prime minister. And in some countries, it, it gets you a prime minister. Uh, when you have a look at uh, the support for Ukraine in some political parties, especially those that are more pro-Putin, we can clearly see that the information environment uh, is being shaped by Russia into lower support for Ukraine. When you have a look at how many uh, important decision makers are talking about the so-called Ukrainian fatigue, uh, or when you have a look at even the weapons deliveries, I'm, I'm very grateful that Ukraine is, is receiving so many, so many Western weapons, but how long time did it take in order to send some, some crucial weapons there? The West was paralyzing itself into not helping Ukraine with the excuse that Russia could escalate. At the moment when Russia is already bombing maternity wards and raping kids, how, how could they escalate? And Russians are using this escalation card um, for decades. They have been using it after after uh, the invasion of Hungary, after the invasion of Czechoslovakia, after the invasion of Afghanistan, they repeatedly uh, scared the West that you do something about our aggression and we will use nuclear bomb. And they are doing it not because they are stupid or because they are not inventive. They are doing it because it works, because we are constantly falling for that repeatedly for decades. So as, as long as we have decision makers concerned about not humiliating Russia, as, as long as we have decision makers concerned about Russia escalating, uh, I'm a bit afraid that, that Russia is still still winning. Carl, you receive some very high levels of intelligence to understand what's coming next. And so would you agree there with Jakob or do you feel that, you know, there are actually gains happening because as we mentioned, possibly we didn't even speak openly about Russia as a disinformation source this openly 10 years ago. Now we are. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, Jakob uh, accurately presents a lot of uh, legitimate concerns that we all have. Um, I think this is very much like the day-to-day uh, -day progress on the front lines. Um, in Ukraine, uh, you have good days and you have bad days, you have successes and you have setbacks. And we're seeing this battle being fought in every country every day. Um, there are days when Russia seems to be gaining in strength. Uh, you look at the Slovakia elections, you look at other recent events that show that a, um, a group that is heavily influenced by disinformation can make a big difference in some countries, including NATO and EU countries. Um, and then you look at uh, other cases like uh, in Czechia, uh, you look at cases where there's more sort of awareness and support for uh, democracy in NATO. You look at Moldova and what they've, uh, uh, the, the people in the government there have recently done to call out and identify Russian uh, disinformation. Uh, Russia will always, at least as long as Mr. Putin is in the Kremlin, uh, Russia will always be engaged in this game. 
uh, and they will always be on the offensive and they will always be looking for opportunities to bring down uh, countries that they see as uh, being uh, associated with the West, with NATO, with Ukraine. Um, and they will exploit every opportunity, including uh, as we're seeing now in the Middle East. So uh, it's, it's a long battle. It, it doesn't have easy uh, victories. There's no sort of uh, happy world awaiting as soon as everybody stops uh, reading disinformation. It's always going to be there and we're always gonna to have to remain vigilant. But the best strength, the thing that protects best against disinformation is uh, informed citizens and uh, free media, investigative reporting, a lot of the uh, tools that were mentioned earlier uh, by Yaku and others. And um, what we just need to do is continue to energize those defenses. Governments cannot fight disinformation on their own. They need to do it uh, together with all of society and when all of society is awake to this problem, it's pretty easy to drive it back into the shadows, not to eliminate it, but to drive it into the shadows. And when society is not aware of or alert to it, it allows Russians and their sympathizers to exploit those cracks in society and widen them and make them worse. So yeah, I just think it's a case of uh, just like uh, fighting a virus, we have to always be ready for the next uh, uh, epidemic. And we have to take the right precautionary measures. And then when it appears, we need to be able to quickly quarantine it and sanitize it, uh, or it will infect us all. Thanks, Carl. And uh, Carl and Jakob are, have both been working overtime there because Sean online came in with a question asking, what can a country like Ireland do to protect against disinformation? And I'm assuming, Sean, you think like I do, that this is quite a small state. What impact can we have? Um, and Carl said, he recommends that Ireland join with the many countries in the EU and beyond that work together to share best practices and fight disinformation collectively. The GEC is working with international partners to build a framework to further energize these efforts. And that's absolutely true, Carl. Um, and some of the organizations that we mentioned earlier with the European Commission, with EDMO, with uh, sitting on the Code of Practice and Disinformation, um, sharing, learning from each other. And Jacob also said that he hoped that the four lines model, which we remember he outlined and there've been versions of that I think we've heard today as well, is applicable in every country. The actors using the specific tools might be different, but the tools uh, will be the same. Um, and he has a link to um, a tweet slash X of his that has a good uh, link to that. So if, if people want to go on, um, he's Kalensky J. Um, and we have one more question I saw here in the audience, and then I might have to wrap it up, or I'm going to be pulled out with a an old fashioned hook, I think. Um, I'll give you mine. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, Dmitro, PR Army. Hi, Jakob, nice to see you. Um, so actually I received the answer for my question, but I will just rephrase it a little bit. Uh, so in 2015, when I worked um, together with NATO, PDD and ATA on counter disinformation projects, the mood in Brussels and at NATO was basically we're losing the war, the information war. And so we are still at this um, stage that we are losing the war. It's been almost, uh, what is it, eight years after all these efforts that has been uh, done. I, I was kind of hoping for a little bit more positive answer from you. Like so many efforts, so many strategic communication campaigns from all over the European member states. And I, I was actually under the impression that people, this is another question because of the EU election that are coming soon. And I was under the impression that people are more equipped with uh, resistance and less susceptible than they were before to Russian propaganda. And so in terms of elections that are coming now, uh, how are we, like, w w do you think people are still as susceptible to propaganda messages as they were before? Okay, he also has a question for me. <laughs> um, is there anybody who wants to take that specifically about the elections, um, whether I mean, it may depend state by state. Carl, yes. Uh, I will defer to uh, yeah. Jakob too, because I think he has an answer. I just wanted to answer the question of, um, are we winning the war and, and how do we win the war? And I don't want to put too much pressure on the very brave people of Ukraine, but to be honest, uh, we will win the disinformation war, or at least a major victory in that war when Ukraine wins the war to reunite their territory uh, 100%. Uh, if Russia is defeated in Ukraine, 
uh, soon or later, uh, and that causes a downfall of Putin's regime in the Kremlin. Uh, you will see, perhaps, ideally, um, a Russia less interested in engaging in this form of global information warfare, and that will have a spillover effect on other countries that do it as well. You won't stop it. It won't mean that new actors don't come up and do it, but one of the biggest drivers and sources of information manipulation right now is the Kremlin, and they're doing it in every country, and they're doing it both openly and covertly. And I think if they suffer a setback such that there is a change of government in Russia, uh, that will be a major victory in a very long war, even though the war will go on over. Jakob, you had your hand up there too. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for the for the question, Mitro. Uh, please don't take me wrong. I don't want to say there has been no development in the last uh, eight, eight, ten years. Definitely a lot has happened. Uh, I mean, in 2015, we, we really felt like like uh, we are uh, three or four lonely soldiers on the barricade in Brussels. And now there is definitely a lot more people uh, working on this topic and not just in Brussels, but in various uh, other European capitals. If you have a look at, at Sweden uh, with their new uh, psychological defense agency, if you have a look at, at, at Paris, uh, the new agency called Visionum, uh, which is working on this, I think I think you would see progress even in Western European countries. Uh, so it's not just the, the brilliant uh, fighters in Ukraine and in the three Baltic states uh, where, where we always had the most activity because they are on the front line, they understand the threat the best. There has been some development, but my fear is that the message that we we are winning or we have already won causes complacency, and I'm not really sure uh, that that's in place. I think I think we still uh, have a lot to fight for. We I mentioned the report we are currently working on with my Ukrainian co-author uh, Roman Osachuk, and uh, uh, we we did many interviews in Kiev in in May uh, and then later in June as well, and uh, we were asking the practitioners both in the government and in the civil society, whether they also think that the information war is already won. And it was quite interesting to see that in, in contrast to many Westerners, we didn't find a single Ukrainian who would have thought that the information war is already won. Uh, everybody understood that they still need to continue fighting, despite the fact that the situation in Ukraine is significantly better than in many European countries. Ukrainians understand the threat much better than, than most of Europe. Um, but still, you wouldn't find a single Ukrainian who would think, OK, job done, uh, now we can go home and, and have vacation. Um, I do fear that some of the developments in Europe, uh, and Karl mentioned the, the elections in Slovakia, and I think this is, this is quite a worrying sign. Uh, I'm a bit afraid that we might see more of that in, in the next few years, and I think we should be very cautious. You mentioned the European elections. I think that will be quite a good test. Uh, what we saw in the last European elections um, is that the pro Kremlin parties are usually doing better than in the national elections. Uh, Marine Le Pen's party was usually scoring higher numbers in the European elections than in the domestic elections, and it was a similar case in, for some other pro-Russian, pro-Kremlin pro -Kremlin parties in Europe. So I'm afraid that if we see a similar development also in these elections, it will also be quite quite a good uh, uh, sign. Uh, how how well are we actually doing when it comes when it comes in fighting the Russian influence? Um, Alessia and Thomas, do you want to add anything about elections before we kind of start to wrap up? Um, I I mean. It better be a quick question if it's for me, and I'll answer in two sentences. It's just a question about Ireland. Uh, so here, because I'm not entirely aware of Ireland, I've worked in other countries on disinformation and Russian propaganda. So if you compare over time, let's say a decade ago and now, what's the dynamic? Is it more active? Is it less active? Because I, when I worked, for example, on Swedish, uh, during the European elections on Sweden, with together with Swedish government on Russian disinformation, I've seen on 2017, I think, it was extremely active, very nuanced, very uh, creative. And I don't see it now, actually. I see it more rude, more violent, and more like throw that blanket over everything and, you know, and there's no specific tailoring. Do you see, how, how is the Ireland? Just like, tell us about Ireland. 
just very quickly then I touched on it at, at the very top when I was introducing but we we weren't really aware of it at all and in terms of disinformation misinformation in Ireland we've been relatively lucky up until the last eight years or so um, possibly because of uh, Ireland's participation in kind of mainstream media and how people sourced it and I suppose as generations moved away from it and I will say that Borja's digital news report is a really good indicator of that but we also see that among older um, cohorts as well where they're relying perhaps a lot on family WhatsApp groups and, you know, that networking thing that we heard about the Ukrainian community, trusting someone you know, but, you know, they're not necessarily going to be the critical thinker who's going to sort out the information for you. Um, what we have seen and what I think is probably, because Ireland probably isn't a huge target or hasn't been, I think our involvement um, with Ukraine and, and its defence um, and the number of people living here fleeing that conflict has um, created an environment in which it becomes valuable to spread, um, I suppose, misinformation and, and complete lies about, you know, how Ukrainians are seen here or, you know, the weakness or not of their campaign. And it kind of tried to destabilize our sense of we're on the right side. I mean, honestly, it's as crude as that. But I, I think what we have seen, and this is purely from seeing what comes up for us in the newsroom, we're online as well, so we have a lot of engagement with our audience. We get tweets and emails and lots of contact from them. Um, and also how we cover the news and then things we see popping up on tools we have used in the past, like CrowdTangle and other things we use now, like News Whip in our partnership, is um, that exact thing of Russian kind of emanating pro-Kremlin pro narratives. And it's not necessarily coming as blatantly from Russia, we're seeing it being voiced by particular politicians. We're seeing it being voiced by pseudo media. We're seeing it um, being repeated by well-intentioned people who just, just, just haven't been part of the conversation about, do you know this sort of thing that's actually going around, has been going around for, for about a year. And now if you, you know, they're not getting the red flags. So the more conversation we have about it, as I said, our fact check unit is very small, but we're, we really integrated into our newsroom because it makes so much sense. Our full-time fact checker sits in our news meeting every morning and is part of the conversation. Um, I, I noticed he was tuning in line. Hi, hi Shane. Um, but, you know, it's, it's that idea that we all, um, and, and we just feel lucky because we, we've just been in that space. I would say vigilance is really, really important right now. And I know newsrooms here are, are generally really alert about it because, you know, I'm not going to throw any stones in any glass houses because we can all be caught. It's so sophisticated. And I think that's where um, it's difficult to... I think that's where it's become a thing, where it wasn't before, is that narratives are seeping in and you don't necessarily know where it's coming from next so you may, may not be as aware of it um, as you should be so I think it's a problem um, I think it's probably increasing and I think that it's actually nearly harder to recognize it um, so more events like this and more people seeing them and tuning into them would be a very good idea now I think I'm gonna have to let people go is that right I bet somebody's booked the room next or something but that was so incredible We've incredible level of, of panelists, both in this and this morning, and all the speakers, Her Excellency here. And, you know, we've been very lucky to have this today, and I hope there'll be more of it. Um, and thanks for hosting it. And thanks for your attention, everyone who's left in the room and online. Um, thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. And I also want to say final thanks to everyone uh, for uh, Susan. Thank you for excellent moderation. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for being with us uh, with all the technical issues. I really would like to um, compliment an excellent teamwork by the three four partners. I would like to thank uh, the team of Ukrainian Action, Martin, Svetlana, Roman, Vlad, uh, Angelika, everybody who contributed to making this event happen. I would like to thank the Embassy of Ukraine, uh, Yuri, Dmitro, of course the Ambassador for making this event happen. Of course our wonderful hosts at the European Commission, Eva, Roman, wonderful catering. Um, thank you for taking care of us today and of course the United States Embassy for supporting it, for bringing such an amazing speakers, Ingrid, uh, Kelly, and uh, everyone who contributed. Thank you for your wonderful questions. 
we really hope that this event is a one step further to the Ukraine's victory and peace in this world. Thank you.